The Subcommittee on Communications and Technology will now come to order. Today, the Subcommittee on Communications and Technology is holding a hearing entitled Strengthening Our Communications Networks Legislation to Connect and Protect. Due to the COVID-19 public health emergency, today's hearing is being held remotely. All members and witnesses will be participating via video conferencing. As part of our hearing, microphones will be set on mute for the purpose of eliminating inadvertent background noise. Members and witnesses, you will need to unmute your microphone each time you wish to speak. Documents for the record can be sent to Joe Orlando at the email address we have provided to staff. All documents will be entered into the record at the conclusion of the hearing. The chair now recognizes herself for five minutes for an opening statement. Back in March, this committee met to execute one of the most important functions holding an FCC oversight hearing. At that hearing, one thing was abundantly clear. There is bipartisan agreement that we cannot let the FCC's auction authority lapse under any circumstances. Congress has extended the FCC's spectrum auction authority on a bipartisan basis several times over the last three decades and has never let it lapse. I'm committed to keeping that unbroken record intact. It is no exaggeration to say that the FCC truly sets the global benchmark for spectrum auctions. To date, the commission has held 98 auctions awarding more than 94,000 licenses and permits, raised more than $233 billion in revenues, and provided more than $1 trillion in benefits for the American people. But the stakes are even higher right now. In July, the FCC will be kicking off the 2.5 gigahertz auction, bringing more needed mid-band spectrum to market. Even a brief lapse in FCC auction authority could jeopardize licenses from being awarded and delay the carrier's ability to supercharge their networks with this 5G ready spectrum that cannot happen. The inclusion of Congresswoman Davids extending America's Spectrum Auction Leadership Act on today's agenda can prevent that. It would extend the FCC's general auction authority for an additional 18 months to March 31st 2024, providing the needed time to complete the 2.5 gigahertz auction. I look forward to working in a bipartisan, bicameral way to give the SCC the authority it needs to maintain Americans' position as a pace setter in wireless communications. I'm also excited to see Congressman Guthrie's SMART Act on the agenda today. As my fellow co-chair of the Con Congressional Spectrum Caucus, we work together on more legislation than I can count and the SMART Act is no different. This important bill would improve spectrum management in the United States by establishing a standardized framework to facilitate spectrum sharing between federal and non-federal users. While I'm interested in pursuing some clarifying edits with Congressman Guthrie, I'm confident that can be done on a bipartisan basis and set the path for a smooth markup and quick consideration on the floor. This bill is smart public policy and tackles an emerging but crucial issue in spectrum, American spectrum leadership. Congressman Carter's ITS Codification Act would also reinforce America's leadership in innovation by providing statutory authority for NTIA's Institute of Telecommunications Sciences. As a research and engineering arm of NTIA, ITS advances innovation in communications technologies through cutting edge research. The ITS Codification Act also established an, an initiative at NTIA to develop emergency communication technologies for use in locating individuals trapped in areas where mobile connectivity may not be available. We also have two bills on the agenda that will increase broadband access and provide new protections to help survivors of domestic violence and human trafficking. Representatives Luria and Kakos ensuring phone and internet access for SNAP recipients act establishes new reporting requirements to help track and improve lifeline enrollment among SNAP participants. Ensuring critical assistance programs are working together to ensure participants will help deliver better services to those who need them most, especially as we continue to recover from the pandemic. I believe this bill will help provide information to improve the Lifeline program. Additionally, Representative K 
customer and issues safe connections act establishes new protections that will help survivor, survivors of domestic violence and human trafficking gain independence. Too often, survivors of crimes like domestic violence, dating violence, stalking, sexual assault, and human trafficking remain stuck on a family or shared wireless phone plan. This allows their abusers to limit their access to family, social safety networks, employers, and support services. The Safe Connections Act empowers survivors by allowing them to separate a mobile phone line from any shared plan involving an abuser without penalty, including the lines of any dependents in their care. And it requires the FCC to initiate two rulemakings to connect survivors to the Lifeline program and ensure calls or texts to hotlines do not appear on call logs. It's smart policy and I hope our committee will consider it as a markup as soon as possible. I wanna thank the authors of these bills and the witnesses for appearing today. I look forward to hearing your testimony and now I want to recognize my friend, Ranking Member Lada for his opening statement. Well, thank you very much. And uh, Madam Chair, thanks very much for calling for today's hearing. And also thank you to our witnesses that are appearing before us, greatly appreciate it. As our nation's spectrum resources become more scarce, good public policy plays an increasingly important role in ensuring efficient use. I am encouraged that today, this subcommittee is considering legislation that will allow the United States to better utilize these valuable airways for economic growth and innovation. Recently, Chairman Doyle and I introduced the Spectrum Innovation Act to accelerate commercial access to the lower three gigahertz band. Access to this mid-band spectrum is needed to bring 5G to farms and households across rural America, and I am proud to have worked with my colleague to come to an agreement on this legislation which should move through Congress and should be sent to the president's desk. I'm also pleased that we are considering the Extending America's Spectrum Auction Leadership Act of 2022. This legislation extends the FCC's authority to con conduct spectrum auctions and issue licenses for 18 months, which will allow the FCC to continue its ongoing work to make more spectrum available for commercial use. Without congressional action, the FCC's authority will expire on September 30 of this year, and I urge swift passage of this bipartisan legislation to avoid any disruption to the FCC's planned auction activities, like auctioning the 2.5 gigahertz ban. While these are great steps forward, our work is far from over. The FCC, NTIA, and industry must continue to identify opportunities to use spectrum more efficiently, which remains difficult as the demand for wireless technology grows and spectrum resources become more congested. Fortunately, we have engineers at NTIA's Institute for Telecommunication Sciences, or ITS, who play a critical role in advancing technologies that help NTIA better manage federal spectrum resources. ITS played a key role in developing the solutions to spectrum sharing between federal and commercial users in the Citizens Broadband Radio Service Band. Spectrum has been previously been underutilized by the federal government, it is now able to be used commercially to promote 5G while protecting federal incumbents. ITS's role will only continue to grow in its importance as spectrum repurposing decisions become more difficult, which is why Mr. Carter's legislation, HR 4990, the ITS Codification Act, is so important. This legislation takes an important step forward by strengthening ITS authorities and recognizing the contributions the lab makes uh, to our wireless economy. In order to identify areas where federal spectrum use can be more efficient, Congress must provide NTIA with necessary tools to advance the spectrum management mission. To further this effort, Mr. Guthrie's SMART Act requires NTIA to establish an incumbent informing capability to take a holistic view of how federal users are using their spectrum resources across the government to identify opportunities for new commercial uses while preserving federal missions to keep our country safe. As the spectrum management decisions become more difficult, we must utilize every tool in the toolbox to efficiently use these airways and provide certainty for commercial investment and wireless developments. I am pleased to see the legislation on today's hearing and look forward to discussing these important topics. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. 
The chair recognizes Mr. Pallone, chairman of the full committee for five minutes for his opening statement. Thank you, Chairwoman Matsui, and it's good to see you chair in the subcommittee today. And let me point out to our members that uh, this is what we call a virtual committee week as set by the uh, by the speaker. And there are three committee days today, tomorrow and Thursday, and we're having a subcommittee hearing uh, each of those days, two of which are uh, legislative hearings. So we're, we're always busy, uh, even when we're virtual. Um, we're continuing this committee's longtime work in this subcommittee of ensuring that our nation's communications networks are stable, secure, and reliable. Communication networks are essential infrastructure to help connect friends and families, relay emergency communications to the public, allow business operations to run more efficiently and effectively, and deliver education and health services. At today's legislative hearing, we'll discuss five bills, most of which are bipartisan, on a broad range of proposals aimed at ensuring that these invaluable networks continue to deliver this critical service to consumers. I'd like to comment and give my own view on these bills. First, I'm pleased that we're considering H.R. 7783, the, expand, the Extending America's Spectrum Auction Leadership Act, introduced by Representative Davids, Joyce, Welch, and Johnson. This committee has a long tradition of working together in a bipartisan fashion to lay the groundwork for technological innovation in this country. We're called the Innovation Committee, and this legislation is no exception. It will extend spectrum auction authority for the Federal Communications Commission by 18 months from its expiration date later this fall. And as a result, the FCC will be able to hold its planned auction of the 2.5 gigahertz band in July without disruption and also fully close out auctions that have already occurred. Congress has never let the FCC spectrum authority lapse since authorizing it in the early 1990s. So I'm pleased we're taking this important step forward today. Also want to thank the FCC Chairwoman Rosen Wurzel for her leadership on this issue and emphasizing its importance. Uh, I agree with the Chairwoman. I'm hopeful that the Congress can come together to use the funding from the upcoming auctions to fund important priorities like Next Generation 911 and the replacement of suspect communications equipment, among other good ideas. Next, we're considering H.R. 7132, the Safe Connections Act, introduced by Representatives Custer and Eshoo and co-sponsors by Representative Welch and Wahlberg. While there's no question that wireless phone service can be an important lifeline for survivors of domestic violence, human trafficking, and other related crimes, it's also the case that shared mobile service plans can subject these individuals to hidden risks, such as digital abuse. So this bill addresses this abuse by requiring mobile service providers to separate the survivor's phone line from an account shared with their abuser without financial penalties or other potential challenges after they receive a request from a survivor. The FCC would also be required to establish emergency communication support for these survivors. This is life-saving legislation that has already passed the Senate, and I welcome the opportunity to discuss it here today. We're also considering H.R. 4275, the Ensuring Phone and Internet Access for SNAP Recipients Act, introduced by Representatives Luria and Katko. Since 1985, the FCC's Lifeline program has provided a discount on phone service to qualifying Americans, but the data demonstrates that only a fraction of Lifeline eligible individuals enroll in the program. So this bill would require the FCC to annually submit a report to Congress on the Lifeline program's enrollment of individuals participating in SNAP. It would also require the FCC to report to Congress on the enrollment of new broadband consumers in the Lifeline program and the effectiveness of advertising on these numbers. Now, finally, we'll consider two bills uh, directed at the work of the National Telecommunications and Information Administration, specifically H.R. 4990, the ITS Codification Act introduced by Representatives Carter and co-sponsored by Representatives O'Halloran, and then uh, separately H.R. 5486, the SMART Act introduced by Representative Guthrie, and collectively these bills provide NTIA with access to innovative spectrum management solutions led in part by NTIA's Institute for Telecommunications Scientists, ITS. As the engineering laboratory for NTIA, ITS helps drive innovation, enables the robust development of telecommunications infrastructure and helps protect an open global internet. So finally, I did wanna also recognize if I could today, a departing member of the Energy and Commerce Committee team. Parul Desai is a native New Jerseyan and has done terrific work for the committee over the past five years since she joined us as a detail from the FCC. She's now headed to a new role at the NTIA, 
We all know the incredible amount of work that agency has before it, and I just want to wish her nothing but the best in her future pursuits. So thank you, Parul. And with that, I yield back the balance of my time, Madam Chair. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes Mrs. Rogers, ranking member of the full committee, for five minutes for her opening statement. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, everyone. The success of our nation's wireless future depends on smart management of our spectrum resources. Earlier this year, we had a hearing on spectrum issues where we heard overwhelming support from witnesses to extend the Federal Communication Commission's spectrum auction authority. To ensure the successful competition of the FCC's upcoming spectrum auction of the 2.5 gigahertz band. This will allow carriers to expand 5G across the United States. I'm pleased to announce that this committee responded. Today, we are considering bipartisan legislation to extend the FCC's auction authority for 18 months through March 2024. This bill will ensure the agency completes their ongoing spectrum activities and it provides certainty to bidders in the upcoming 2.5 gigahertz auction that the FCC will be able to use their licenses if they bid. I want to thank Chairman Pallone and Chairman Doyle for working with us to reach this bipartisan agreement, and I look forward to advancing this legislation. As demand for wireless technology grows, we need to adapt to make sure our spectrum resources are used efficiently. While it is critical to repurpose spectrum from federal to commercial use, it is becoming increasingly difficult to find prime spectrum bands that are unencumbered. I'm pleased that we're considering my colleague, Representative Guthrie's SMART Act today, which requires NTIA to establish an incumbent informing capability. This will allow NTIA to see spectrum usage by agency across the federal government and help them improve spectrum use efficiently while also protecting national security. Representative Carter's bill, the ITS Codification Act, will codify the important duties of NTIA's Institute for Telecommunications Sciences, the government's premier radio frequency laboratory, clarify the agency's responsibilities, and direct them to advance spectrum repurposing opportunities and certify new technologies as we continue to advance American wireless leadership. U.S. leadership and next generation technology depends on our ability to develop innovative solutions to repurpose spectrum for commercial use. This will ensure spectrum resources are available for future uses not yet known and maintain the United States reputation as the number one place for businesses to invest in innovation and grow the economy. This committee is leading on solutions to make spectrum resources available. But to unleash the full potential of today's spectrum legislation, we also need to address barriers to deploying wireless infrastructure. Energy and Commerce Republicans are leading on a package of bills, the Boosting Broadband Connectivity Agenda, which roll back duplicative, burdensome regulations and permitting requirements to speed up deployment of broadband infrastructure. Without permitting reform, it will be difficult for the United States to compete and beat China. If we fail to address these reforms, this committee will miss an opportunity to strengthen American leadership in next-gen communication technology. We're also considering legislation that would allow survivors of domestic violence and human trafficking to separate from any shared mobile contracts with their abuser. Republicans have several changes we'd like to see made to this bill if it advances, but we stand ready to work with our colleagues to find a solution. Survivors of domestic violence must have the freedom to have a new start, to be safe and secure, and able to separate from their abuser quickly. This hearing is a great first step to discuss these bills and hear from witnesses about how they will impact the marketplace. I look forward to hearing from all of you, and I yield back the remainder of my time. The gentlelady yields back. The chair would like to remind members that pursuant to committee rules, all members written opening statements shall be made part of the record. I now would like to introduce our witnesses for today's hearing. Ms. Anna M. Gomez, partner, Wiley Ryan, LLP. Dr. Thomas E. Caudry, assistant professor, University of Georgia School of Law. 
Mr. Mark Gibson, Director, Business Development and Spectrum Policy, Comscope, and Regulatory Officer of the ONGO Alliance, and Dr. Alisa Valentin, Senior Director of Technology and Telecommunica Telecommunications Policy, National Urban League. At this time, the chair will recognize each witness for five minutes to provide their opening statement. Ms. Gomez, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairwoman Matsui, Ranking Member Latta, Chairman Fallon, Ranking Member McMorris Rogers, and the distinguished members of the subcommittee for the opportunity to appear before you today. My background from working at the FCC and NTIA, as well as my experience in the private sector, give me a unique view of spectrum challenges. However, my testimony today reflects my own views and are not necessarily those of my clients. The task that NTIA and the FCC share in managing our nation's airwaves can be daunting, given the diverse array of stakeholders and interests, as well as our continuing need to identify additional spectrum for new and innovative uses. It is important to bolster and respect the agency's shared responsibilities. I therefore want to first commend and thank the committee for its bipartisan attention and commitment to exploring ways to strengthen U.S. Manage, uh, spectrum management. The Simplifying Management, Reallocation, and Transfer of Spectrum Act would authorize NTIA's proposed incumbent informing capability, which would provide a common platform for sharing. I want to applaud uh, Congressman Guthrie for introducing this thoughtful legislation. NTIA's missions are critical and complex. The tools Congress has provided ultimately allow NTIA to draw on its experience to ensure continued U.S. leadership in facilitating the development and deployment of new and innovative services, which spur economic growth, investment, and job creation, while ensuring that the federal agencies have the spectrum they need to meet their mission. The Institute of Telecommunication Sciences, or ITS, Codification Act, is another important step in ensuring that NTIA has the tools necessary to effectively manage the country's spectrum. ITS is an integral arm of spectrum management efforts by providing research, testing, and analysis, both to NTIA as well as to entities with which it is contracted, like commercial providers and other government agencies. By providing the statutory authority for ITS, the act will further support spectrum management initiatives. And I want to commend Congressman Carter for introducing this legislation. In recent years, the NTIA and FCC coordination process has been increasingly challenging. However, the two agencies recently announced their new joint spectrum coordination initiative. Of the commitments they announced, developing a national spectrum strategy is particularly essential, and any strategy should include identifying additional spectrum for new uses while continuing to ensure that federal agencies can meet their missions. Of course, identifying additional spectrum would be of little use if the FCC does not have the authority to conduct auctions to license that spectrum. In addition to encouraging the best and highest use of spectrum, spectrum auctions have raised over $200 billion in federal revenue. Congress has in turn used that revenue to significantly reduce our national debt and to pay for key national priorities, such as the First Responder Network Authority and for 911 grants. Revenue from spectrum auctions also helps facilitate the repurposing of federal to non-federal spectrum through the Spectrum Relocation Fund. Accordingly, Congress's extension of the FCC Spectrum Auction Authority is of paramount importance. I want to thank the bipartisan leadership of this subcommittee for reaching a compromise to extend the FCC's auction authority. Once extended, this subcommittee has an important role to play in overseeing the work in producing a national spectrum strategy that identifies additional spectrum bands for repurposing. I want to conclude by urging the subcommittee to continue to look for ways to improve the existing spectrum management framework. In that regard, I refer to FCC Chairwoman Rosenworcel's recent letter to the House and Senate Commerce Committee leaders regarding improvements Congress can make to existing spectrum processes which includes recommendations for updating the Commercial Spectrum Enhancement Act, or CSEA, to make it even more effective for repurposing spectrum. While the CSEA is an effective tool, there is room for improvement. For example, Congress can further incentivize federal agencies by removing the comparable capability limitation, 
which then would allow federal spectrum users to modernize their outdated equipment as part of the spectrum reallocation process, generating greater incentives to relinquish underutilized or duplicative spectrum bands. In addition, reforming CSEA to cover costs to evaluate impacts to non-federal bands where there are strong federal equities would allow NTIA to examine thorny issues affecting commercial providers. Thank you again for allowing me to share my thoughts with you on my perspective on pending legislation to improve our nation's spectrum management activities. I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you. Dr. Kadri, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Chair Matsui, Ranking Member Latta, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, I greatly appreciate the opportunity to testify before you today. By way of background, I'm a law professor at the University of Georgia, where I'm also affiliated with the Institute for Women's Studies and the Institute for Cybersecurity and Privacy. I obtained my PhD from Yale Law School, and my research focuses on the legal and technological regulation of privacy, speech, and abuse. And as an affiliated researcher with Cornell's Clinic to End Tech Abuse, CETA, I work directly with victims of digital abuse and advise lawmakers on how to address it. Now, I use the term digital abuse to refer broadly to how people exploit technology to harm others. More specifically, digital abuse involves using technology to control, harass, stalk, surveil, or threaten someone in a way that invades their privacy or autonomy or harms them emotionally, physically, reputationally, or financially. Now, digital abuse is on the rise. Domestic violence charity Refuge estimates that 95% of its cases involve technology, while the National Domestic Violence Hotline has seen a 155% increase in reports of digital abuse between 2015 and 2018. And those numbers have surely grown during the pandemic. These statistics might initially seem shocking, but one in three women and one in six men have experienced abusive relationships. And so given how central digital technologies have become in our lives, their growing role in interpersonal abuse is predictable. Why is digital abuse so harmful? Well, this is obviously a, a complex question, but one common theme is that abusers use technology to become ever present in a victim's life or at least to create that impression. Now, though it might be tempting to focus on more sensational topics like stalkerware apps, the work of Dr. Karen Levy and others has shown that digital abuse is often mundane in that it requires little to no sophistication and relies on everyday devices and services. And a classic example of this is family phone plans. Information that an abuser can gather from these plans might exacerbate abuse and even thwart a victim's attempts to escape. And these serious yet underappreciated risks make family phone plans the snake in the grass of domestic violence. These plans let an abuser monitor a victim's calls, texts, and even their precise location of their device. An abuser may, for example, discover where a victim is currently hiding or planning to go, as well as any contact they've had with family members, domestic violence hotlines, or crisis response centers. As Diana Freed, a lead researcher at CETA has observed, people would come into our clinic and report that the abuser knows where they are. They've left the abuser, they've moved on to a new relationship, new friends, and suddenly all of their contacts have been contacted by the abuser and there was no idea how this person got the numbers. So though a victim could always abandon their uh, device entirely, this might actually worsen matters if their phone and its number connect them to friends, family, work, and crucial services that can help keep them safe. And if a victim does try to leave a family plan, phone companies often charge high fees of up to $350 per line, in addition to demanding upfront payment for any devices being financed in installments. Now, for many victims, paying these sums all at once will exceed their financial means, especially when their abuser controls their economic resources, as is common with domestic violence. And currently, no federal law allows victims to leave family plans. Existing state laws, meanwhile, provide inadequate protections. And people in states without any legal right to get out of a family plan, especially people with low incomes, could effectively be trapped in a contract that allows their abuser to control them. 
A strong federal law empowering victims to leave family plans would help vulnerable people in all states to cut this dangerous tie with their abusers. The legislation before your subcommittee, the Safe Connections Act, represents significant progress by making it easier to leave family plans quickly, remotely, and for free. Victims rely on phones as a lifeline, but that same technology can simultaneously expose them to abuse. And the act represents a careful effort to respond to how phones play this essential but complicated role in victims' lives. It's encouraging to see the bipartisan consensus that has emerged as the act has passed through Congress or progressed through Congress. And even the telecommunications industry has now signaled its support. Federal law should allow victims to make a clean break from their abusers with minimal barriers and risks. And the Safe Connections Act would be a step in the right direction. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Um, Mr. Gibson, you are now recognized for five minutes. And thank you, Chairwoman Mitsui, um, and uh, Chairman Doyle, Ranking Member Lada, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. It is truly an honor and a pleasure to be here today, if only virtually. I'm here today in my capacity as regulatory officer and board member of the ONGO Alliance. The mission of the ONGO Alliance is to support the common interests of members, implementers, and operators for the development, commercialization, and adoption of LTE and 5G solutions for the US 3.5 gigahertz citizens broadband radio service. This is a very important band for the 5G deployment in our country, as it is one of the first 5G bands available. And I'd like to discuss how the legislation that is the focus of today's hearing will enhance the importance of the band and allow for greater deployment of broadband. Deployment in the citizens broadband radio service or CBRS launched in January, 2020. In the nearly two and a half years since CBRS service launch, there have been well over 200,000 base stations deployed across the country. These deployments support all reaches of telecommunications, including support for distance learning during COVID, enabling hospital COVID triage centers, helping otherwise poorly connected farmers achieve 5G connectivity, support for critical manufacturing automation, and helping to connect disparate corners of our supply chain. CBRS literally saves lives. The CBRS band is shared with several types of incumbent operations, including fixed satellite service, legacy broadband, and the DOD. Sharing happens through a spectrum access system or SAS. The role of the SAS is to tell CBRS base stations what frequencies they can operate on at their locations without causing interference to incumbent operations. For fixed satellite and broadband incumbents, SASs know where these operations are and can easily perform frequency availability analyses. However, for DOD operations, which are generally a specific type of naval radar onboard aircraft carriers, it is not possible for the SAS to know exactly where they are located for national security reasons. Therefore, these operations are identified through coastal sensor networks called Environmental Sensing Capability, or ESC. Each ESC network is comprised of scores of coastal sensors that sense radar operation and alert SASs which then tell CBRS base stations to avoid the radar frequencies in use. ESC sensors must quickly sense radar operations that occur over 150 miles off the coast, which means that ESC sensors are extremely sensitive to very weak signals, and this also means that ESC sensors can be susceptible to interference from CBRS base stations. To avoid interfering with ESC sensors, CBRS devices as far as 25 to 50 miles from an ESC sensor must operate at reduced power or avoid operating altogether. This creates a de facto protection area around each sensor where CBRS device operation is either curtailed or extremely limited. ESC operators have tried to minimize these protection zones through sensor design and, by, and location by placing sensors as close to the coast as possible. But sometimes avoiding populated areas is inescapable. Because of reduced availability of CBRS, ESC sensor protection affects millions of Americans in coastal regions, as well as CBRS licensees who paid over four and a half billion dollars for their spectrum in an FCC auction. However, there is a remedy to this problem in the form of a portal-based incumbent informing capability. The NTIA has proposed creating a portal they're calling the Incumbent Informing Capability or IIC. The IIC would allow for any federal spectrum user to notify about their operation with at least a few minutes notice. This would then be communicated to SASs. Federal spectrum users could specify a time, duration, location, which could be an area, and operating frequencies, 
and this information could be provided to SASs, which would then perfect, protect the areas if, as if an ESC sensor had sensed the radar. The only drawback to the, ES, to the IIC is authorization and funding. There is currently no firm timeline for the construction of the IIC and no authorization or specified funding source. The IIC would greatly enhance 5G operations in CVRS, including allowing our operators to increase power levels and fully realize the value of the band allowing potentially millions of Americans along the coast to benefit. This is why the ONGO Alliance fully supports HR 5486 or Simplifying Management Reallocation and Transfer of Spectrum Act, the SMART Act, and we, are, we honor uh, Congressman Guthrie's work on this. The, the SMART Act will provide the NTIA with a timeline and funding authorization to build a capability that will allow for sharing in all bands, not just CBRS. Thank you again, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Um, Dr. Valentin, you are now recognized for five minutes. Thank you so much. Uh, Chairwoman Matsui, Ranking Member Latta, Chairman Pallone, Ranking Member McMorris Rogers, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. My name is Elisa Valentin, and I am the Senior Director of Technology and Telecommunications Policy at the National Urban League. I bring you greetings on behalf of our President and CEO, Mark Morial. In my prior role, I was a special advisor to FCC Commissioner Jeffrey Starks, where I advised the commissioner on broadband policies that impact communities of color and low-income communities. And in this capacity, I made policy recommendations regarding the FCC's Lifeline program. I was also the per person watching the live stream or sitting behind my former boss as he answered from the committee, uh, but my virtual seating arrangement has changed a bit today. The National Urban League and our 92 local affiliates have long recognized that access to high-speed internet is a civil right. The COVID-19 pandemic demonstrated that everyone needs broadband to learn, work, receive healthcare, and access critical government services, no matter their income, no matter their race, and no matter their geographic location. Last year, the National Urban League published the Lewis Latimer Plan for Digital Equity and Inclusion, where we presented four goals, which included deploying networks everywhere, getting everyone connected, creating new economic opportunities to participate in the growth of the digital economy, and using networks to improve how we deliver essential services. We recognize that in order to achieve these goals, we must erase pertinent connectivity gaps, including availability, adoption, and affordability. Today, I will focus on affordability. Nearly 47 million people in the United States are left offline because they are unable to afford broadband, and this disproportionately impacts Black and Latinx households. In fact, 29% of Black adults and 35% of Latinx adults do not have a home broadband connection. Prior to the pandemic, low-income families were dependent on the FCC's Lifeline program, which was the only federal program focused on providing affordable communication services to low-income households. This program must be modernized to reach households who need it most because it's very underutilized with a participation rate that hovers at around 19%. We need a whole of government approach to get households enrolled in what is already a literal lifeline for millions of families. That is why the National Urban League supports the goals of ensuring phone and internet access for SNAP Recipients Act of 2021, which requires the FCC and USDA to submit an annual report to Congress on enrollment and lifeline by SNAP recipients. It also requires the commission to report on projected lifeline consumers through federal assistance programs and the efficacy of various efforts to advertise the program. The requirements of this bill should be extended beyond lifeline to include the affordable connectivity program, which was established with the passage of the bipartisan infrastructure law. Almost 12 million households have enrolled in ACP and estimates show that approximately 48 million households are eligible. Congress, the FCC, and NTIA have recognized that outreach efforts must include the funding of trusted organizations working on the ground. The National Urban League could not agree more. We believe the burden of advertising these programs should not fall solely on the shoulders of advocates seeking to serve the underserved. There needs to be more resources provided. We also think about 
and solutions for the future that can extend the life of the program. Although the National Urban League has not taken a formal position on the spectrum bills being discussed today, uh, we do believe that Congress should consider a number of ways to provide permanent, sustainable funding for ACP, such as using proceeds from spectrum auctions to fund digital equity and affordability efforts. In an era of rising income inequality and increasing dependency on the digital ecosystem, we must recognize that there is a moral imperative and an economic benefit to connecting everyone to high-speed internet, including both workers and small business owners. The National Urban League believes that spectrum auction winners should also be encouraged or incentivized to hire from underrepresented communities beyond entry-level positions, establish diversity hiring goals, and increase supplier diversity. Our organization has taken up efforts to increase equity in companies because we know that Black and Latinx workers and entrepreneurs deserve to experience the economic benefits of this sector. We have reached a critical juncture in history, and it is time to move forward in creating an inclusive technology ecosystem that centers the needs of communities of color and low income communities. Thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony today, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you. We have concluded openings. We will now move to member questions. Each member will have five minutes to ask questions of our witnesses. I will start by recognizing myself for five minutes. The FCC's 2023 budget estimate to Congress earlier this week is express confidence that the 2.5 gigahertz auction will likely conclude before the end of fiscal year 22 when current auction authority is set to expire. But it also notes that certain post auction activities requiring FCC staff resources may continue into fiscal year 23. Ms. Gomez, yes or no? Do you believe extending the FCC's auction authority will help ensure the 2.5 gigahertz spectrum gets to winning bidders without issue? Yes, Chairwoman. Okay. I've long been interested in supporting agencies to find innovative ways to share underutilized spectrum for commercial use. The SMART Act introduced by Congressman Jeff Guthrie would provide new resources to NTIA to support the development of a new spectrum sharing system to enable more federal and non-federal coordination. Mr. Gibson, why is it important to have a standardized framework for sharing spectrum across federal agencies? And could you describe the potential for the system to support commercial applications? Uh, yes, Congresswoman and Chairwoman Matsui, thank you very much. Um, that's an excellent question. Um, the IIC uh, is, uh, is a project that the NTIA has conceived uh, to facilitate a job that they are already doing sort of in the background, which is supporting the sharing of spectrum. What the IIC would do, as I noted in my testimony, is allow a more robust capability, uh, thereby doing away with these sensing networks that have been uh, uh, deployed, which sense a federal operation in situations where there may be issues of classification. So the concept of the IIC is to uh, move that responsibility over to the NTIA by allowing them to build a, 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 an informing portal that federal spectrum users would then put that information into the portal and then that information would be uh, made available to commercial users with the appropriate protections for classification domains. Um, and so we believe uh, that this is probably one of the best ways to effectuate commercial federal sharing. And as the NTI have noted, that can operate across all spectrum domains where there is federal commercial sharing. Okay, thank you. Uh, while we've made strong progress over the years, freeing up spectrum for commercial use, we need to keep looking for new opportunities to replace the spectrum pipeline to support 6G, Wi-Fi 6, and satellite broadband. Ms. Gomez. What role does federal equipment like receivers and other technology play in supporting or limiting our ability to free up spectrum? Uh, thank you for that question. Federal agencies have equipment that at times is aging. And unfortunately, the Spectrum Relocation Fund does not permit the agencies to use those funds to do anything but replace their equipment with that that has a comparable capability. The comparable capability thus serves as a disincentive to the extent the agency's equipment is close to the end of life or is decades old. So permitting agencies to expand their systems capabilities would serve as powerful incentives to agencies to plan for repurposing their spectrum. 
Okay, thank you. Um, the FCC's Lifeline program has helped ensure Americans experiencing economic hardship can maintain broadband and voice services. At the onset of the pandemic, I wrote then Chairman Pai, urging him to take immediate steps to grant provisional approvals for Lifeline subscribers as they become eligible directly or via qualifying support programs. It's important that we continue to reduce barriers to and expand the awareness of the Lifeline program. Dr. Valentin, do you see additional opportunities to streamline the lifelong enrollment process and increase coordination between the FCC and other federal agencies to increase awareness of the program? Yes, definitely. You know, the bill before um, us today at its core is about understanding where we are, understanding where we're hoping to go, and identifying any gaps that may persist in the road to get there. Um, I think that it'll also help us to understand, you know, who is eligible uh, for the Lifeline program. Is it folks who are struggling with housing insecurity? Is it folks who are struggling struggling with food insecurity? And that can then help organizations like the National Urban League uh, figure out where we need to focus our efforts to raise awareness about the Lifeline program and the Affordable Connectivity program. Okay. Thank you. My time is expiring, so I yield back. And uh, I recognize Mr. Lotta, subcommittee ranking member, for five minutes to ask questions. Well, thank you very much, Madam Chair. And uh, again, thanks to our witnesses for being with us today. Greatly appreciate it. Uh, Mr. Gibson, if I can start my questions with you. And again, um, the new uh, wireless use cases demand federal agencies to identify new and innovative tools to make more efficient use of spectrum use. And incumbent informing capability system seems to show great promise for enhancing NTIA's ability to manage federal spectrum and increase opportunities for commercial use. This tool would give NTIA a greater understanding of how and when federal spectrum users are occupying the airways. How would this tool help promote better interagency coordination of spectrum uh, resources? Well, thank you, Chairman. Well, that's an excellent question. Um, the as you as we all know, the NTIA sort is the is the spectrum manager for the federal government, uh, and in that role, the NTIA is ultimately responsible for interfacing with commercial users uh, in that in that regard. The informant incumbent capability will allow other federal spectrum users, the agencies, to interface with a portal that the NTIA that can, can then use to make um, uh, that information aware to uh, commercial spectrum users. This could be made aware through this thing I talked about called a spectrum access system or otherwise. Um, NTIA is, has uh, just constructed a, a, a very broad concept for this. So this, this the, the, the concept of the IIC should, should facilitate sharing across all federal spectrum domains just by being there and allowing the federal spectrum users to put their spectrum usage capabilities or spectrum usage um, uh, information into this that would thereby be made available to commercial users. Well, thank you. Uh, Ms. Valentin, uh, HR 4275, the Ensuring Phone and Internet Access or SNAP Recipients Act would require the FCC to report on the enrollment of the Lifeline program that also participates, participates in the SNAP program. Uh, what benefit, if any, would this provide? Um, I believe that it will help um, the FCC better coordinate with USDA. Um, I think it can be extended, obviously, to other federal agencies. As I um, just stated, it's important for us to know where we are, where the gaps um, in participation are. And I think it's also um, really important to help us understand um, what effective kind of advertising efforts there are out there so we can better focus those efforts as well. Let me follow up. Uh, does the FCC currently have the SNAP enrollment data or would this be new data collection? There is some uh, data that um, with USAC, I know that there is data about kind of like the SNAP uh, databases um, and the folks are kind of like directly enrolled like, through the states, which I believe that enrollment rate is at about 13%. Uh, um, but then there's also folks who um, get into the program on like kind of a, a multitude of, of databases. And I don't have clarity and I don't, I'm not sure the FCC has clarity on how folks are entering when they're um, eligible through kind of like multiple uh, programs. So this will just better help us kind of pinpoint that information. Hey, thank you. You know, I, I'm also going to note that there's currently an ongoing uh, discussion required by the infrastructure law as to what the future of the uh, universe of service fund should look like in light of all the funding appropriated for the purpose of keeping Americans connected. So I'm not really sure right now if this legislation is uh, necessary at this time. 
Mr. Gibson, if I could uh, go back to you, a question. The ITS Codification Act will provide additional tools and authority for NTI's Institute of Telecommunication Sciences. As a significant user of the CBRS spectrum, which ITS help uh, make available for commercial users? You have benefited um, from their work. What role did ITS play in the CBRS framework? And how can ex expertise be utilized to address our future spectrum management challenges? What an excellent question. Um, uh, ITS started off initially by doing a series of interference measurements, uh, bench, bench type and lab type interference measurements of radar systems into commercial, commercial systems. Um, that report was huge and um, uh, was made available initially so that the commercial world could better understand what role the radars play in causing or mitigating interference. So that was the first work they did. Uh, as we move through, uh, uh, ITS actually were the agency that did testing for the ESCs and the SASs. Uh, on behalf of the FCC, they did all of the testing for all of the ESCs to test us against commercial availability. Um, and then uh, as we've been, been working through this, they've conceived, I'm not sure if they've actually, actually been able to do it, propagation uh, modeling uh, uh, efforts to help better inform the propagation models that we've been using. Well, thank you very much, and Madam Chair, before I yield back, I'm going to have to uh, turn uh, my spot over to my good friend uh, from Florida, Mr. Bilirakis, uh, because I'm going to have to be at a uh, fentanyl roundtable. But I really appreciate today's hearing and uh, thank the witnesses and thank you very much, Ma Madam Chair, and I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes Mr. Pallone, full committee chairman, for five minutes to ask questions. Thank you, Chairwoman Matsui. I, I'm going to try to get three questions in, so I would ask each of you to know, only take a minute or so. Um, Ms. Gomez, can you talk to us about how access to spectrum enhances our mobile broadband networks and what consumers and the public will lose if auction authority isn't extended in one minute? <laughs> yes, that's a very good question. Thank you. Um, so access to spectrum allows mobile networks to meet broader capacity, speed, and low latency needs of our next generation technologies. Um, and it would be bad for consumers if uh, we lost the ability to auction uh, the licenses because it would delay disproportionately the rollout of services to consumers. Well, thank you so much. I, I wanted to ask a little bit about um... Uh, survivors of domestic violence. We know that domestic violence, human trafficking, and other related crimes are a serious concern, and studies indicated that at least one in four women and one in 10 men have experienced sexual violence, physical violence, and are stalking by an intimate partner uh, during their lifetime. So, and too often these abusers use technology and the internet to bully, intimidate, or control a partner. So the question for Dr. Kadri is how could family mobile service plans place survivors of domestic violence and other related crimes in harm's way? And would providing survivors with the ability to separate their phone service from their abusers help? Thank you, Chair Pallone. Um, I uh, Absolutely, the family plans allow abusers to monitor a victim's calls, texts, and even their locations sometimes. And so all of this information from family plans can enable further escalation by the abuser. And safety planning is so essential uh, when a victim is trying to leave an abusive relationship, but that same planning can also create immense danger if an abuser discovers an imminent departure. Um, and so as things stand, there are just too many obstacles and risks involved. And we hear these stories all the time in our work at CETA. I'll just mention one briefly. It was a, a client uh, who was on a family phone plan and then the abuser left the country permanently. And so uh, this client couldn't, uh, you know, get released from the family phone plan because the, the abuser couldn't even be be contacted. And we have all sorts of other stories where people have struggled to to get out of these family phone plans and the Safe Connections Act could really change these conditions by giving victims a right to leave their phone plans quickly, remotely, and, and for free. Well, thank you. And then lastly, I want to ask about the Lifeline program, which you know uh, provides uh, eligible families with phone service, so no one would be without a phone line in case of an emergency or keep in touch with friends or loved ones. 
it's been proven to be essential program for many people, though we know that just a fraction of the eligible population, just about 19%, believe it or not, is enrolled. So my question of, is Ms. Ms. Valentin, in your opinion, could the data reporting requirements in HR 4275 help policymakers and community organizations raise awareness of the Lifeline program and ultimately help those who need this help? I mean, obviously we want more people to sign up, if you will. Yes, thank you for the question. Um, yes, the, the data reporting requirements in this bill can absolutely help community organizations uh, raise awareness about the Lifeline program and figure out where uh, we need to target our efforts. And it's also about accountability as it relates to government agencies fulfilling their obligations to help people most in need. You know, at the National Urban League, we understand that access to critical communication services, such as the Lifeline program, directly correlates to economic opportunity for both workers and entrepreneurs. And we want to be able to close those opportunity gaps. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, Chairwoman Matsui. Thank you. Um, the chair now recognizes Mrs. Rogers, full committee ranking member, for five minutes to ask questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning again. I'm really pleased that we have come together with bipartisan legislation to extend the FCC's auction authority for 18 months. Ms. Go Gomez, uh, this 18 month extension will allow the FCC to complete the auction of the 2.5 or 2.5 gigahertz band and avoid disruption to the FCC's spectrum op operations. However, some people think that the FCC's authority should be extended for a longer term such as 10 years. What are the benefits of extending the FCC's auction authority for 18 months versus a longer term extension? Yes, thank you, uh, uh, Congresswoman, for your question. Um, I do think a lengthy extension can be very beneficial, but at this point, the 18 month extension is the most practical path at this point in time. Um, we only have a short time left before September 30. Uh, we don't have any current spectrum identified, so there wouldn't be any spe spectrum in the extension of the authority. Don't have a national spectrum strategy either. So it's probably best at this point to extend, but have Congress provide the oversight as, as the FCC and NTIA develop their national spectrum strategy. Ms. Gomez, as a former Deputy Assistant Secretary of NTIA, you have firsthand experience about the role that NTIA plays in spectrum management. NTIA's federal lab, the Institute for Telecommunication Science, Sciences, ITS, does important work to understand radio frequency propagation and develop technologies to improve spectrum efficiency. What role does ITS play in the federal government? Apologies for the delay in unmuting. Um, ITS plays a very important role in, uh, in spectrum management, supporting NTIA as it makes its decisions, as well as uh, it, 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 with regard to federal spectrum use, as well as as it coordinates with the FCC on uh, spectrum decisions that might affect federal agencies. Um, it conducts research and, and, and development, it conducts testing, it also um, enters into agreements with other federal agencies to conduct tests for them, as well as with commercial providers. Um, so there's a variety of ways that ITS is important in the, in, in the spectrum management ecosystem. And, and as we look to the future of wireless technologies, we know that effective spectrum management is critical to our success. How can we better leverage ITS to promote innovation and continue to compete with China in deploying wireless technology? I'm so glad you raised this question because ITS uh, is a very important component of spectrum management, as I mentioned. Um, it's also largely funded through these agreements. Um, and so being able to, to uh, pass the act uh, that, that is being proposed, being able to draw attention to the importance of its resources, and being able to bolster the ITS functionality all will help support our efforts both domestically and internationally. Thank you, I appreciate that. Mr. Cadre, earlier this year, the Senate passed the Safe Connections Act to ensure survivors of domestic abuse can separate from a shared phone plan with an abuser. 
This is important legislation to bring survivors one step closer to a more hopeful, safe, and secure future. However, it's also important that we get the details right in this legislation so that both survivors and wireless carriers have a smooth process for providing relief. Would you speak to the challenges survivors of domestic violence face when they're trying to separate from a, the shared aspects, such as a shared phone contract? Absolutely. Thank you, Congresswoman. So the, the, the obstacles are many and varied, um, but I'll just focus on a couple uh, since I know time is short. Uh, for one thing, it can be quite um, uh, difficult to even detect uh, this level of surveillance that goes on through family phone plans. And so some victims are just frankly unaware of it. But then when they do become aware, trying to actually protect themselves can be a real challenge. Oftentimes, phone companies uh, won't allow for changes to the accounts unless they have the primary account holder's permission, which in many cases will be the abuser themselves. At other times, uh, there are considerable fees and upfront costs uh, that really make this kind of barrier to, to separating the line uh, too daunting uh, for survivors to go through. I'd be happy to, to mention other obstacles, but those are a couple that I think are a particular concern to survivors when they're trying to protect themselves and get out of these plans. Well, thank you. And um, do you think including a remote option to request a line separation might be part of the answer? Absolutely. And I'm pleased that the act, uh, at least as I read it, does include such a protection, um, particularly uh, given the fact that so many um, survivors may have real concerns about going into a physical store, uh, particularly in smaller communities where the people working in the stores may know them, they may know the person of concern. So I think providing that remote option is crucial. Super. I appreciate your insights and your work. I yield back. Thank you. The uh, gentlelady yields back. The chair recognizes uh, Mr. McNerney uh, for five minutes to ask questions. Well, I thank the chair for holding his hearing, and uh, I thank the committee staff for putting it together, and the witnesses for bringing your expertise here this morning for us. Um, Ms. Gomez, how would greater spectrum sharing between the federal and non-federal entities impact the current deployment of our 5G networks? Uh, thank you, Congressman, for that question. Um, sharing is certainly a tool in the toolbox for 5G deployment. Um, as it becomes more and more challenging to identify additional spectrum, sharing enables us to find new ways to, to uh, obtain spectrum. But, of course, it continues to be preferable to provide cleared spectrum for auction to enable infrastructure providers and manufacturers the certainty they need to make the necessary investments to establish U.S. leadership in 5G and beyond. Well, I mean, do you think moving toward a more agile spectrum a sharing environment will blur the lines between licensed and unlicensed spectrum? Ms. Gomez? Uh, thank you, Congressman. Uh, I think we have the technology or the systems in place today to get to an environment that would blur the lines between licensed and unlicensed spectrum, but I can imagine some time in the pretty far future when that could happen. It would require, of course, investments in technology, changes in our allocation processes, and how um, our regulatory agencies approach spectrum management. But in the meantime, unlicensed spectrum has been hugely successful with a tremendous impact on the economy. But there is also an important place for license spectrum. So, as I mentioned, for auctions to succeed, the participants must have the certainty necessary that makes them willing to invest in the auction as well as to invest in deploying the network. Well, well thank you. Uh, again, the, the spectrum sharing framework outlined in the SMART Act includes a system to enable time-based spectrum sharing. Uh, so, Ms. Gomez, what degree of automation would be required to ensure successful implementation? And do you see a role for artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, in time sharing and distribution of the spectrum? Yes, yeah, so I have to admit I'm not an expert in, in this exact area, but I will point out that NTIA uh, wrote a report um, on the IIC a while ago in which it mentioned that eventually the system should lead to a point where AI and machine-based learning is utilized as a method of, um, of uh, implementing these sharing mechanisms. Good. Um, uh, thank you for that uh, response. Uh, Mr. Gibson, in your written testimony, you explained the concept of incumbent informing capability as a mechanism to manage 
interference more effectively between federal and non-federal users, specifically uh, in the citizens band radio service? Uh, could the IIC be expanded to other parts of the spectrum? Uh, thank you, Congressman, for that question. And that's a very good question. And to clarify, uh, I don't know that I'm, I think the IIC manages the interference. It manages spectrum availability, thereby l reducing the capability for interference. But absolutely, it could be applied to other parts of spectrum. Uh, in fact, the NTIA's uh, vision for the IIC is to be used across all spectrum domains where uh, there will be federal commercial sharing. And it could also be extensible to um, uh, federal federal sharing to the extent that, that that's a thing. Yeah. Um, but uh, it, 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 their, their vision on it is very broad and it could really easily very effectuate uh, federal commercial sharing in any spectrum band. Is, is artificial intelligence used in that process or planned to be used in that process? It's not planned to be used in that process, but artificial intelligence, machine learning absolutely lend themselves to spectrum management. That's my area of expertise. And full disclosure, we were a SaaS provider, we are an ESC provider, and we've been using bits and pieces of artificial intelligence to improve the, um, the fidelity of, of responses to spectrum queries, thereby mitigating or mi eliminating interference using those types. It's a little nascent, but it, it is beginning. Excellent. Well, what implications would um, an IIC have for unlicensed 5G and deployment of broadband? Well, they could, the, to the extent that any sort of uh, deployment will be in shared spectrum, the IIC would, wouldn't matter what spectrum is being managed. So it could handle, uh, it could handle licensed, it could handle um, auction spectrum, it could handle unlicensed. Uh, for example, in the six gigahertz band in the United States, there is this concept being called an automatic frequency coordinating system that's coordinating much like a SAS for commercial uh, uh, six gigahertz unlicensed and uh, around microwave systems. The same thing could be applied in, say, the seven and eight gigahertz band sharing with uh, federal and federal systems up there. So it would absolutely lend itself to that. Very good. Um, thank you. Looks like my time is about expired, so I'm going to yield back. Thank you for, for your responses. Thank you. Um, the chair now recognizes um, Mr. Guthrie for five minutes to ask questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. You said in your opening statement that we worked on more spectrum bills than we can count, and I agree. And each time it's been a pleasure to work with you and our staff has been a pleasure to work with your staff. So appreciate that very much. Uh, my first question today is for Ms. Gomez and, and I, I want to thank you for your support of my legislation. Spectrum is obviously uh, a valuable and increasing scarce resource. And I believe we need to do all we can do to ensure that every spectrum user is efficient as possible, including the federal government. So my question is how would an, an incumbent informing capability help NTIA work with federal agencies to resolve technical barriers to make it more federal spectrum available for commercial users. Thank you, Congressman Guthrie. So while there is a preference for clearing bands for exclusive use, it is getting harder to fully clear bands and sharing has some benefits. Um, the IIC will provide needed transparency and certainty during uh, sharing scenarios. It would also replace some of the current dynamic sharing methods that are proving to be technically challenging. Um, I would note that the capability will not enable the use of fully clear spectrum, but to the extent there are geographic sharing opportunities, it would pr pr permit broader uses of spectrum in areas where the federal agencies may not be operating. Thank you. Yeah, I keep muting in between, so it doesn't have feedback, so sorry. Um, the SMART Act, and Ms. Gomez again, the SMART Act directs NTIA to establish a standardized framework for federal spectrum users to share more real-time usage information. Um, as NTIA seeks to identify new bands to clear for commercial use, how would this tool help preserve and enhance federal missions that are key to protecting our national defense, such as those carried out by the Department of Defense? We all want access and better spectrum, but we also want to make sure our agencies, our, our particularly the Department of Defense and others, can accomplish their core mission. So how does this balance that? Thank you, Congressman. That's right. And I mean, NTIA's mission is to support the uh, other agencies' ability to fulfill their missions through the use of spectrum, um, while balancing, of course, uh, uh, the need to support innovation for the economy. Um, the IIC would enable federal missions to continue using their spectrum, but on a shared basis. So it gives a broadening opportunity um, to access more spectrum while permitting the agencies to continue to utilize them. 
Okay, thank you. And one of the bill we're discussing uh, is focused on sharing. I want to reiterate my continued support for making additional spectrum available through auctions or licensed commercial use. So, Ms. Gomez, again, can you talk about the role NTAA in finding ways to incentivize federal agencies to be more efficient with their spectrum so that we can make more spectrum available for non-federal use? And does this bill strike the right balance between prioritizing auctions where possible and sharing where auctions are infeasible? Uh, thank you, Congressman uh, Guthrie. I'm really glad you asked me that question because it's something that I feel very passionate about. Um, in NTIA's role as spectrum manager, NTIA must work with all agencies to make sure they are making efficient use of their spectrum. It is challenging, however, for NTIA to motivate other agencies to work on either identifying spectrum or to make more efficient spectrum use if the sole purpose is to repurpose their spectrum for other uses. They are understandably focused on fulfilling their missions, while NTIA uses the efficient use of spectrum while supporting it, the innovation economy. So the, uh, the CFPA has provided tools for NTIA in its efforts to repurpose spectrum, but I noted in my testimony, it could be broadened to provide additional incentives. In addition, it is helpful when Congress or the White House includes spectrum beds to be studied or auctioned in its legislation or in executive orders or memoranda such actions bolster the work that NTIA is doing and gets the federal agency's attention and helps provide that motivation. Okay, thank you. I, I appreciate that. That completes the questions that I have. So I'll yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes Mr. O'Halloran for uh, five minutes to ask questions. Thank you, Madam Chair and Ranking Member for holding this meeting today. Uh, we need more hearings like this where, where we're working together to solve a problem, where we're more focused on finding a solution than partisan bickering, and I appreciate the bipartisan emphasis on this meeting. I want to voice my support for the Safe Connections Act introduced by my friend, Congresswoman Kustner. Uh, which would take necessary steps to protect victims of domestic abuse and other crimes. Now, thank you for your leadership on this, and I'm glad to see this committee consider the bill and hope to make it move through the House quickly. Another bill we're considering today addresses a problem I see far too often in my district and in un under-resourced communities in general. Congress passes legislation oftentimes aimed at helping struggling communities, working families, or seniors but the people it's supposed to help don't know the program exists or that they're eligible at all. Far too often, people don't know how to navigate bureaucratic systems. We should be doing everything we can to make it easier for them to get the help they need. Uh, Ms. Uh, Valentin, uh, what does a whole of government approach look like when reaching underserved and under-resourced communities? Thank you so much for the question. Um, you know, I would say a whole government approach means that federal agencies across the board are using their existing authorities, using their existing resources to reach underserved communities in a coordinated fashion. Um, eligibility for, for programs like Lifeline and the Affordable Connectivity Program, you know, are based on eligibility for other federal assistance programs, but far too often federal agencies are working independently to administer their respective assistance programs. So agencies can, you know, work on creating coordinated, you know, educational materials they can share information across agencies and just work on effective outreach efforts. I, I was just uh, out in the field uh, yesterday uh, in my district at three different communities, and each one of those communities brought up a lack of knowledge on what was going on with the different programs within our whole of government approach. Uh, so somewhere along the line, we're missing the opportunity to get the information out there. I know that. Uh, my staff does a, a consistent job on that, uh, but we have to find a way to, to, I don't care where it's at and what agency it is, we have to find a way to get, to allow our citizens to know what's, what, what's going on out there. Uh, another question, uh, Mrs. Valentin, uh, beyond this bill, are there other approaches Congress should consider to ensure eligible households access programs like Lifeline and Affordable Connectivity Program uh, for example, certain tribal programs administered by the Bureau of Indian Affairs qualifies households for the ACP 
should Congress consider requiring BIA to provide information to eligible households about the ACP, or should other agencies be working together in the, that whole of government approach to get this information out to people? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, well, as, as you know, uh, tribal communities are disproportionately disconnected and they're dealing with both access issues as well as affordability issues. And with the Lifeline program, as well as the ACP program, you know, that's recognized and that's why tribal communities receive those enhanced benefits for broadband services. But those benefits can only be effective, as you said, if households actually know that these programs exist. So I think that Congress should definitely explore all options that encourage and incentivize federal agencies to work together in reaching these households. And I think cross collaboration between the FCC and the BIA can certainly help increase enrollment. And we've certainly welcomed legislation that supports those goals. Uh, thank you very much. I'm also glad to see this committee consider bills, given the NTIA and the uh, FCC the necessary tools to manage spectrum in an efficient and innovative way. Spectrum is a public resource. It belongs to all of us, but it is also a finite public resource. Our approach to spectrum policy must reflect that reality. Ms. Gomez, uh, what actions can and should the FCC and the NTIA take to ensure that spectrum bans are used as efficiently as possible? Thank you, Congressman, for your question. Um, the FCC and the NTIA uh, are constantly trying to evolve what they do to ensure spectrum bands are used as efficiently as possible. But from a high level, I would say, um, number one, increasing transparency as much as possible. Um, sometimes this can be difficult with sensitive or classified systems, but the more knowledge that we have about how spectrum is being used, the more creative uh, ways we can come up with uh, using spectrum more efficiently. Oh, I see I'm, we're out of time. Planning as far ahead as possible and participating in research and development. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. I, uh, I yield. Thank you. The gentleman yields. The chair now recognizes uh, Mr. Bill Rockus for five minutes to ask questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Appreciate it very much. Like uh, many of my colleagues, I'm pleased to see a bipartisan bill to extend the spectrum auction authority for an additional 18 months. The benefits that auctions have uh, have brought through increased revenue, technological uh, innovation, and consumer choice have been immeasurable. Uh, Ms. Gomez, if this legislation is not signed into law and the FCC's auction authority is severely restricted, what implications does that have on the international stage? And would we be allowing our international competitors, unfortunately, like China, to have a leg up on leading the future of technology. Yes, Congressman, that's a very important point. I do think it would have a significant um, uh, effect on our international standing, largely because it would make it would put us back to the old fashioned way of licensing spectrum, which is very lengthy and inefficient. And so we would be significantly delayed vis a vis other countries who are actually quite advanced in providing spectrum for new and advanced services. Thank you. Uh, next question. It's been some time since I've brought up uh, natural disasters in this subcommittee. And with June 1st being the beginning of Florida's hurricane season, the time is right to remind people of the dangers, but also the promise that technology brings to have, uh, again, we need to save lives. Uh, Congressman Carter's ITS codification act includes the creation of an emergency uh, communications and tracking technologies initiative that would help locate trapped individuals during events when communication lines are down, helping save lives when seconds count. Uh, again, Ms. Gomez, what can Congress do to continue advancing ITS leadership in technological innovation? Thank you for that question. ITS, ITS does core research for public safety to better understand the components of a communication signal need to be prioritized to see through smoke in a video, um, to have resolution, the necessary resolution for public safety responses. So um, the work that they're doing is very important. 
adequately funding idea to conduct this research is critically important for us to be prepared as a nation to meet the challenging of a changing environment and what that poses to communication systems. Um, so, you know, Congress it, supporting the act is, is terrific um, and continuing to find ways to utilize ITS and to bolster its um, funding would be terrific. Thank you. Uh, as a follow up, uh, Mr. Gibson, what role can ITS play in developing technologies to more efficiently use spectrum resources? Well, thank you for the question. That's very insightful. And I would say that, you know, I wanted to make sure that I did say this, that I think in my opinion, ITS is probably the best at what they do. And so um, I think that some of the collaboration that ITS has done uh, with industry and also with the federal government in terms of innovation, um, uh, what we can do in industry and also federal government is come up with process with ideas and then NTIA uh, ITS can then um, instantiate those ideas in whatever they can build models, they can build tools um, and which is some of what they're doing now. In fact, they had built a tool to support spectrum sharing uh, in other spectrum bands in the AWS band. Um, so I think allowing as as, as uh, Ms. Gomez said. Um, allowing them the funding they need to get going, allowing a collaboration with other experts in the industry, uh, I think that'll help uh, bring about what we're looking for. Sounds good. Thank you, Mr. Gibson, and uh, I yield back the balance of my time, Madam Chair. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes Mr. Soto for five minutes to ask questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. The internet is integral to our daily lives. From online education uh, to e-commerce, telehealth to smart agriculture, access to high-speed internet is essential for all Central Floridians. We made a, a big promise and put our money where our mouth was with the infrastructure law, $65 billion for a high-speed internet for rural broadband. Uh, it's gonna be key for uh, rural areas of Florida as well as uh, low-income areas of Florida that uh, right now don't have equal access uh, to internet. General auction uh, for an additional 18 months makes sense. Uh, we must carefully make spectrum available to the private sector, balanced against defense and aviation concerns. And this is gonna help us with that right balance. And I applaud the SMART Act, which is gonna standardize spectrum sharing uh, framework we also see more specific legislation on the agenda today to help victims of domestic violence and human trafficking by requiring providers to prove separate lines. Uh, can you imagine, and I've heard horror stories in our district of victims being And, and how that can put folks in, uh, into danger. There are many isolated areas of the Sunshine State also. Uh, so this is gonna be key in emergency response. Uh, Mrs. Gomez, it, it'd be great to hear a little more about some examples of how uh, there's interagency hangups, barriers and conflicts as we're uh, trying to deploy a new spectrum. What, what actually happens on the data data to slow this stuff down and how does the SMART Act to address that? Thank you, Congressman, for that question. Um, so, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, I actually think the coordination between the agencies is quite good. Um, there's a good relationship at the staff level between the agencies. What becomes difficult is um, when we are asking agencies to put away their attention from their day-to-day -day missions and to focus on finding ways to free up spectrum for other uses. Um, so, as I mentioned before, what we need is incentives to, for the federal agencies to, be, to focus and to provide the, the engineering that is necessary in order to determine how we can utilize spectrum either more efficiently or repurpose it for other uses. Um, and you, oh, please continue. Sorry, go ahead. And you believe the SMART Act would help address those incentives? Um, I think to a 
certain extent, it helps address those incentives. It's important that NTIA have that capability and that NTIA's authority be bolstered and recognized as the manager of federal spectrum. Um, so to, for purposes of sharing, it would definitely help NTIA um, fulfill its mission and work with the FCC to find more ways to share spectrum. Okay, so it helps, but we have more work to do. Dr. Kadri, uh, my constituents would be shocked to know that domestic violence and human trafficking victims can't even separate a shared line from their attackers. Uh, and I was looking in your testimony about roughly only a dozen states provide protections. So 38 states across the United States have nothing to help um, victims of domestic violence uh, get away from something as essential as having their own cell phone. And you also mentioned your testimony requiring a court order. So does this legislation, uh, will it help those other 38 states and will it need a court order or will we be able to really fast track this going forward? Thank you, Congressman, for the question. Uh, it certainly would help um, all of those people in states where there are just no existing protections. And no, thankfully, the bill as currently drafted would not require uh, the burden of trying to seek a court order to force a phone company to do this. Uh, the survivor would have to provide certain documentation from a third party in order to get the line separation, but they wouldn't have to go to court in order to be able to do it. And, and that would be a big change, even for those folks in, in many of the other states where there are some limited protections for them. But as you point out, for, for those folks in, in other states uh, who currently lack any legal recourse to do this, it, it would make a big difference. Thanks, Dr. Kadri, and I'm, I'm proud of this legislation to make sure we're empowering victims, and I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes Mr. Long for five minutes to ask questions. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. And uh, Ms. Gomez, I, you can probably see on the wall behind me my 42-year-old auctioneer license plate from here in Missouri. And uh, so I've got a long, long history auctioneering before I went to Congress 12 years ago. And the FCC Spectrum auctions have helped create the wireless services that we all enjoy today. Congress can take a little bit of credit for this success story also. With one exception, every time Congress extended the FCC auction authority, we told the FCC to auction Spectrum. It seems to me that this short-term extension will give Congress the time we need to find the right bands in which to auction. Ms. Gomez, isn't that why a short-term extension of FCC's auction authority, as included in H.R. 7783, makes the most sense? Uh, yes, Congressman, I agree. It makes the most sense for the reasons you articulate. Thank you. And uh, also, sticking with you, Ms. Gomez, the National Telecommunications and Information Administration, NTIA, of course, is statutor statutorily, easy for me to say, statutorily responsible for representing federal views on spectrum matters before the FCC and FCC actions may affect a federal user spectrum use. In recent years, this process has gained public attention. How would standardized framework contemplated in the SMART Act improve NTIA's ability to represent federal views? Uh, thank you, Congressman, for that question. So the SMART Act will both provide NTIA with a more transparent and efficient tool to permit it uh, to enable the sharing of federal spectrum, it also recognizes that NTIA is the manager of federal spectrum and bolsters its status by that recognition. Okay, and why is it important that NTIA retains its role as the spectrum manager across all federal agencies rather than have each agency manage their own spectrum use? Thank you, Congressman. This is a very important issue. NTIA must retain its role as the spectrum manager across all federal agencies. There's an important distinction between the agencies, which are spectrum users, and NTIA, which manages spectrum used by federal agency. Placing the responsibility for managing spectrum within the spectrum user, whether it's a federal agency or a commercial user, would present an inherent conflict of interest. Even the FCC doesn't manage its own spectrum. Rather, because the FCC is a federal user, NTIA manages its spectrum. So the federal agencies each have their own missions to accomplish, and managing spectrum efficiently is not among those missions. 
NTIA has to balance its duty to ensure that federal agencies can perform their missions with its duty of working with the FCC to enable new and innovative uses to enhance the U.S. economy. To perform this mission well, NTIA must remain the regulator and be charged and bolstered as the agency that makes these difficult decisions. Okay, thank you. And I told you I was a fast talker, so Adam Chairwoman, I yield back one minute and 45 seconds. Thank you, Mr. Long. The chair now recognizes um, Ms. Rice for five minutes to ask questions. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Um, and Ms. Gomez, I'd like to continue along with Billy, um, Rep, I'm sorry, Rep Long's questions. Um, I, I, I hear you on NTA IA remaining the, the manager of all the spectrum. And what I've heard a lot about is um, ways that we can make that management more efficient I'd just like to go back a step. Can you tell us the ways that spectrum is being inefficiently used? Um, you know, in order for us to make sure that we come up with ways to make sure that the management is as efficient as possible and maybe give examples of either specific bands that have historically been underused or that are ripest for repurposing. Uh, thank you for that question, uh, Congresswoman. So, um, NTA actually has an interestingly efficient way of managing spectrum in that it, it actually facilitates more sharing between federal agencies than what you see at the FCC's licensing process, which tends to be more exclusive licensing. Um, that can also create um, certain inefficiencies. For example, when NTIA um, approves systems that have similar products, but they're utilizing different bands for those products for different reasons. This happens in, for example, the 1 gigahertz band where you have FAA sensors, you have DOD, you have, um, I believe it's NOAA uh, that has have similar uses, similar uh, products that they utilize, but they're utilizing them in, in ways that really could be consolidated and therefore, there could be more spectrum freed up. So that's one example of inefficiencies um, that could be addressed. And are, are we addressing them, or how do we address them, so that we make sure that these that that this limited finite universe that we have is managed most efficiently? Well, honestly, I think one of the, yes, of course, NTI is constantly studying ways to to make the uses more efficient. Giving them the tools to be able to uh, upgrade their, their spectrum management systems, which are quite antiquated at this point, would be really helpful. Increasing the transparency of, of federal uses. And as I mentioned, increasing the incentives for federal agencies to study their own systems and to find ways to move or repurpose the ones that they have so that we can uh, free up additional spectrum for new uses. Well, that's that, thank you so much, Ms. Gomez. That's very helpful. Um, I would like to uh, turn to Dr. Um, Valentin, if I can, for a sec. Um, legislation like HR forty two seventy five is important because it's going to help Congress understand why eligible. And we've talked about this all morning, but why eligible individuals end up enrolling, and more often, why they don't enroll in Lifeline. Um, while this bill is focused on Lifeline enrollment and SNAP eligible individuals, it should offer important lessons for every agency and program that qualify um, a consumer for Lifeline. So for instance, more than 10% of Lifeline beneficiaries are veterans, even though just 0.08% of participants, that's one out of every thousand, uh, qualify for the program through their veterans pension or survivor pension. So Dr. Valentin, are there ways for the Department of Veterans Affairs and other relevant agencies to improve coordination and outreach around the Lifeline and ACP program so that more qualifying veterans are able to take full advantage of the program? Thank you so much for the question. 
question. Um, you know, as the daughter of two veterans, the sibling of a veteran, I'm really glad that you raised this because I think that veterans are often a, a group that's left out of these conversations when we're talking about the digital divide. Um, and they make so many sacrifices uh, for our country. And there's also folks who deal with kind of multiple levels of marginalization. For example, you know, Black veterans, uh, one third of all uh, veterans experiencing homelessness are Black veterans. And I do think that we need a whole of government approach to getting households enrolled um, in the Lifeline program, in the affordability, uh, affordable connectivity program as well. Um, and we need to make sure that if someone signs up for a program, you know, at the VA, they sign up for a program at USDA, they are immediately notified about all the other programs that they're eligible for, including mm -hmm. Lifeline program, including the affordable connectivity program. All right, that's good to know. Thank you. I just want to thank the witnesses so much and thank Madam Chairwoman and the ranking member for um, bringing this hearing today. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you. The gentlelady yields back. The chair now recognizes uh, Mr. Wahlberg for five minutes to ask questions. Mr. Wahlberg? Uh, can you... Mr. Wahlberg, are you hearing us? We can't hear you. Okay, let's go on to somebody else. Schrader? Oh, uh, Long, Long, sorry, Long. No, Long's already done. Okay. The, uh, is Mr. Can you, can you hear me now, Madam Chairwoman? Yes, I can. Uh, sorry you. about that. Okay. Sometimes technology uh, doesn't work in a tech uh, committee, I guess. I understand. I thank the witnesses for being here today. And, and uh, uh, today's hearing touches on a number of extremely important bills for both consumers and businesses. But first, I want to highlight the importance of H.R. 7132, the Safe Connections Act. I joined my colleagues, Representative Eshoo and Custer, as lead Republican on this legislation because no one should ever have to make the choice between staying connected and staying safe. Uh, this partisan bipartisan bill allows uh, survivors of domestic violence, stalking and other harms to separate their phone line from any cell phone plan shared with their abuser without having to worry about financial penalties or other requirements. It also directs the FCC to examine further ways to support and protect survivors after they disconnect. Shared plans can be used by abusers to continue stalking or controlling their victims and fees and arduous paperwork should not be another impediment to survivors getting to safety. I'm extremely heartened by the broad support this uh, legislation has had. Uh, the wire industry worked closely with domestic violence groups to come to an agreement that passed the Senate by unanimous consent. And I know that we here in the House can do the same. Uh, Dr. Cordry, uh, your testimony outlines the patchwork of state laws that currently exist to address digital abuse and shared mobile service contracts. In what ways does the Safe Connections Act strengthen current laws to make gaining digital freedom easier for survivors and, and also what gaps still remain? Thank you, Congressman, for the question. Uh, the Safe Connections Act, I think, uh, really sets a really solid foundation uh, from which we can kind of expand protections for survivors. So it sets a, a really good base in making it easier, uh, cheaper, uh, uh, and, and more accessible for survivors to be able to get out of family phone plans that do pose them the risks that I've discussed this morning. Uh, and then it also empowers the FCC, I think, to engage in some really wise uh, and innovative rulemaking to try and provide further protection. So I think, for example, the provision uh, in, in the bill that's before you that would uh, have the FCC look into uh, removing or concealing communications with domestic violence hotlines from phone bills uh, would be of crucial importance to survivors as they try and safety plan and get out of an abusive uh, relationship. And similarly, the efforts to expand access to the lifeline plan, um, as my fellow uh, expert today, Dr. Valentin, has, I think, so compellingly told us, is just so essential in trying to close that digital divide. Uh, so I really commend those aspects of the bill. Thank you. Um, also, Dr. Kadri, uh, the legislation tasks the Federal Communications Commission with determining which program, the Lifeline program or the Affordable Connectivity program, 
is best suited to provide emergency communication support to survivors. Which of these programs, if I could ask, uh, do you recommend for this purpose? Congressman, I, I can't say that I have a firm uh, view either way on that one. Um, I would sort of defer to the expertise somewhat of, of, of those, you know, within the FCC who, who really engage with those programs. And I think actually some of the other legislation that's before your subcommittee today to try and gain a better understanding uh, of how these programs are used or unfortunately more often not used by people could be really important in trying to figure out which of the plans make the most sense. Uh, but I do think that providing that kind of support uh, through one plan or the other would be of, of great importance to survivors. Thank you. Uh, well, all of my questions have been asked about HR 7783. I do want to applaud uh, that legislation, the Extending America's Spectrum Auction Leadership Act. Uh, this short-term extension will ensure that we have an uninterrupted and well-coordinated spectrum pipeline and it is key to the United States remaining leader in 5G deployment and beyond. And for that reason, uh, the continued efforts in this legislation uh, need to be done, need to be carried out, and I certainly stand in strong support. With that, I yield back my remaining uh, 38 seconds. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes Mr. Schrader for five minutes to ask questions. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Appreciate the hearing we're, we're having here today. Uh, Mr. Gibson, uh, interference is a, a potentially huge hazard to uh, the aviation industry, both military and uh, civilian. I uh, wanna know what, if you could speak to the issues about wireless interference uh, uh, and what's the state of testing going on to make sure with the spectrum availability auctions that are going on, that uh, that would be minimized or if, if at all possible, uh, potentially eliminated. We've had discussions in this committee about uh, interference for quite some time and what are the standards and how are they being uh, allocated at this point in time? Well, that's an excellent question. Um, and there's a lot of areas where that's pertinent. One of you may be thinking about is the interference situations with radar altimeters. Um, I'm not in the middle of that and probably am not uh, uh, qualified to comment on that other than knowing the issues as a pilot. Uh, and uh, what I do know is there's a lot of work being done with key leadership and key uh, engineers from the FAA, from the FCC, and with wireless carriers, and they're doing their at level best to mitigate that. The new band that's being considered where there may be some aviation interests is the 3100 to 3450 megahertz band. In that band is AWACS AWA operations. Yeah. Uh, and so there's no, at least from what we know about, and this information is, is some of this information is classified and some of it's coming to us uh, in piecemeal. The interference issues there are with respect to the onboard radars. So there's no safety of flight interference issues there uh, in that band. Um, and then there's just generally potential interference issues with uh, aviation in general, for example, like potential uh, for interference with uh, 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 navigations commission. Like, for example, we we're familiar with the issue that occurred years ago with potential inter interference with GPS. A lot of that stuff is being dealt with now uh, in the context of studies that are being uh, 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 taken care of both in the NTIA and the FCC. Uh, and for the most part, the only major issue that we're still facing right now with that is the one that's going on in the um, in the uh, in the C band. And and as far as I can tell, that's on the path to being resolved in time. A related question is: Is there a time frame within which it seems like if we're doing all the the spectrum auctions, it would be uh, extremely important to have this issue resolved at least to, at least for the near term until we learn differently based on the best knowledge. Uh, uh, at hand about well what uh, what interference potential there is uh, you know federal and non-federal uh, agencies as well as uh, uh, military and civilian aviation seems like we ought to have this figured out before we go too far down the line going forward and you know realizing that our, our best uh, efforts and knowledge at this point might change but at least have a standard protocol that everyone should count on that's an excellent point, uh, Congressman. And uh, with respect to the C band, uh, that effort is ongoing. The auction happened. What I can tell you that's going on in the 3100 to 3450 meg band, as you well know by the uh, acts and, and the legislation, that band won't be auctioned before, I think, early, no earlier than November of 2024. And there is study going on as we speak. In fact, I was in a day long meeting yesterday trying to better understand how the equities that uh, are owned by the DOD in that band can, federal, can better share with commercial operations. 
And our goal in that work is to uh, establish better understanding of use cases, both uh, from federal, most, mostly DOD and commercial use, and, there, and, and then uh, try to effectuate solutions for sharing. And uh, we all understand that the primary goal is to not have interference, especially with uh, some of the DOD systems that are being dealt with, but also with commercial systems. Yeah, I would say important for our committee to have a hearing on this, bringing uh, the FCC and NTIA in and have a discussion about timeframes and working with uh, uh, civilian and uh, other federal agencies and come up with a, a, a game plan. Uh, otherwise, we may be ending up uh, still studying things uh, as these auctions transpire. Uh, I guess last question uh, uh, regarding the, and it was hinted at before, which is, you know, why extend the uh, uh, the authority for only a short period of time understood the answer be well we don't have any, any auctions coming up at this point in time but I mean it seems to me why are we not just extending the authority uh, for the FCC to do these auctions uh, indefinitely uh, they will take time there a great deal of work goes into studying the effects and who's interested who's not what the potential uh, uh, problems might be uh, so why are we not at this point in time just giving this authority to the FCC so we don't have to revisit it every so many months and, and put it at danger? Well, I think Ms. Gomez made a very good point about that early on. Um, mostly it's related to, among other things, the fact that we don't have any spectrum auctions teed up in the near future, um, certainly beyond uh, the, the, the horizon for the 18 months. And I also would note that the, the commission is down at commissioner and that some of the folks in some of the key bureaus there are acting. Uh, and so for 18 months seems to be an appropriate time frame, all those things considered. Very good, very good. Now I yield back. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. The gentleman has yielded back. Uh, the chair now recognizes uh, Mr. Carter for five minutes to ask his questions. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank all of the witnesses for being here. Very important hearing, very, very important. Um, as you know, and and I'll, I'll start with you, Ms. Gomez, but um, as you know, I've introduced House Resolution uh, 4990, which is simply to codify the Institute for Telecommunication Services. It also directs the Assistant Secretary of Commerce for Communications and Information to, to establish an initiative that will support the development of emergency communications and tracking technologies. But the main the, the main impetus of it is really for the Institute for Telecommunication Sciences or ITS. Um, as you know, it's um, it's NTIA's lab, and it's it's important for tests and research to solve the the challenges that we have the, the, of the technical issues. Can you just, uh, Ms. Gomez? Can you just please speak to the importance of ITS and? and how this bill will strengthen it in the lab's important work? Yes, Congressman, thank you for that very good question. Um, so NTIA has a very technical mission between spectrum management, supporting technical decision-making and supporting spectrum being transitioned for commercial uses. ITS conducts the studies to enable sharing, for example. What they are doing day to day is support NTI's efforts to make decisions about how to manage spectrum more efficiently and how to avoid interference while supporting agency missions. This includes conducting interference studies for FCC actions that affects federal users. So their work is very important in, in both uh, supporting existing spectrum uses and ensuring that they uh, are in an interference uh, or a harmful interference free environment, but also for finding new and innovative ways to use spectrum um, and enabling uh, decision making that allows that. Great, great. Well, I'd asked Secretary Davidson earlier this year, and I'll ask you the same thing. What role do you think ITS will play in improving NTIA's interagency spectrum coordination mission? Thank you for that question. ITS plays such an important role because what ITS gives us is the engineering base a basis for these discussions and their decisions. They are the ones that provide the proof of how things are going to work. So it's very important for these discussions. So we don't just rely on, you know, generalized discussions or hyperbole. We actually have what we would call a science-based conversation about how to utilize spectrum. Well, let me ask you this. Uh, it's obviously critical to ensure that the FECC continues to have the ability to auction spectrum. We all agree on that. 
But you note know in your testimony that there's a need for better spectrum coordination. Well, based on your experience at, at NTIA, I'm curious, what do we need to be doing to ensure the longstanding interagency spectrum process works? Thank you for that question. I think the most important thing that we need to be doing is recognizing NTIA's statutory role as the manager of federal spectrum. What we have seen is um, if federal agencies uh, or also private parties are unhappy with a decision that has been made, um, then utilize outside of the NTIA and the FCC coordination process in order to continue to litigate some of the issues. And that's just not healthy to have a strong spectrum management process. So bolstering NTIA's position um, is important. The White House needs to strongly support NTIA and to reinforce its role as the federal spectrum manager. If I could also put in a plug, if Congress would see fit to um, elevating the assistant secretary to an undersecretary uh, at the Department of Commerce, it would greatly help with his position, his or her in the future, um, in its negotiations with high level uh, representatives from other agencies. How do you think it, why would it help if, if he would have to be elevated? You know, it, it's amazing how protocol sometimes falls into play with these types of negotiations. Um, if, you, if you have an assistant secretary sitting in a room with a deputy secretary of DOD, there are times when perhaps uh, the staff may be unwilling to allow that kind of negotiation to happen. And yet it has happened in the past. Past NTIA has had sat down with the Deputy Secretary of De Defense in order to talk about repurposing spectrum and management sp of spectrum generally. So it's just a protocol issue, but it definitely helps. Much like having an ambassador status helps in the international negotiation process, having an undersecretary status helps in the domestic negotiation process. Okay, okay. Well, thank you, and I yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Um, now the chair recognizes, um, let's see, Mr. Cardenas for five minutes to ask questions. Thank you very much, uh, <clears throat> Madam Chairwoman and Ranking Member for holding this hearing um, and for, to all the witnesses for your testimony and your expertise and your opinions on, on the matters today. Uh, we know more than ever that broadband must be more accessible for all Americans to succeed. About 38 million people in the United States benefited from the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, also known as SNAP, in 2019. Uh, this is about 12% of our total U.S. population. We also know that too many eligible people don't know that the FCC's Lifeline Program exists. SNAP recipients, for example, automatically qualify for the Lifeline Program, which offers discounted phone and internet service. More than 33 million households are eligible to receive Lifeline support, yet only one in four of those households in the United States actually takes advantage of it. Uh, this question is to Dr. Valentin. How does the FCC's Lifeline program, among other federal programs, help close the digital divide? And what can the federal government do to improve outreach efforts for programs like this one that promote access to low-cost broadband service and to help increase participation rates and public awareness in all communities including underserved communities and rural America. Thank you so much for the question. Um, you know, affordability is often cited as the biggest barrier that's preventing communities from adopting broadband. And uh, both the Lifeline program as well as the Affordable Connectivity program are the strongest tools that we have uh, to help bridge that affordability gap. Um, by lowering the cost of, of monthly broadband services for millions of households. Um, as you stated, um, both of these programs are very, very undersubscribed. I think that public-private partnerships are really important. Um, as we saw a few weeks ago at the White House, their recent event where they announced industry commitments to ACP um, helped increase dramatically the, the awareness around that program. And also, um, we have to make sure that we're prioritizing the funding of trusted organizations that are working on the ground uh, to reach communities where they are. Uh, thank you. And also, thank you for earlier reminding us how important it is that we try to reach out and support our veterans uh, because of the disproportionality of veterans who aren't connected to the internet, internet and also the disproportionality of veterans who actually are homeless. The Lifeline program has helped millions of people connect to vital tools 
and stay digitally connected. The bill introduced by my colleagues, Rep. Luria and CATCO, uh, HR 4275, Ensuring Phone and Internet Access for SNAP Recipients Act of 2021 would help lower the cost of phone and internet access for families that, that benefit from the SNAP program. I commend my colleagues uh, who are working on this issue and I look forward to working with them and the chair, per, chairman uh, to ensure that all American families have the vital resources that they deserve to be at, to have access and afford phone and internet services and stay digitally connected. When it comes to Wi-Fi uh, and extending uh, uh, spectrum auction authority, I'm glad that today's legislative hearing also includes the discussion of HR 7783, the Extending America Spectrum Auction Leadership of 2022. Introduced by my fellow colleagues, Representative Davids, Welsh, Joyce, and Johnson, Congress must act now to ensure wireless operators have a, a continuing supply of the spectrum they need to keep the United States at the forefront of global 5G investment and innovation. Um, 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 Ms. Gomez, uh, never has the value of Wi-Fi been more apparent <clears throat> than during the COVID-19 pandemic. And even though spectrum auctions raise funds directly for the US Treasury, how can Congress better account for the vast economic and so societal benefit offered by unlicensed spectrum when identifying spectrum bans for commercial use? Uh, hi, uh, Congressman Hernandez. Thank you so much for that question. It's a very good question. You know, I would refer you to uh, the letter that uh, Chairwoman Rosenworcel wrote to the leaders of the Commerce Committees, both in the Senate and the House, where she talks about how to uh, value uh, unlicensed spectrum, uh, which is used for, for Wi-Fi, um, in order to, to demonstrate or to, to take into account the tremendous economic value that unlicensed has given to our economy um, as it uh, conducts its analyses of, of spectrum bills. It, it, it only does so for auction spectrum, but it, the fact is the downstream effects of unlicensed spectrum are tremendous for our economy. So uh, looking at ways to do that would be very helpful. Yes, uh, thank you very much. And, and, and once again, we have uh, some incredibly talented commissioners and uh, Chairwoman Rosenworcel, uh, I've known for many years and who's been working really hard on this issue and, and uh, trying to be as innovative as possible and is incredibly accessible to uh, constituents like mine across the country. So with that, Madam Chairwoman, I wanna, I'll yield back. Thank you so much. The gentleman yields back. The uh, chair now recognizes um, Ms. Kelly for five minutes to ask questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Dr. Kadri, you mentioned in your testimony how corporate programs meant to help abused victims are often so poorly advertised that victims are highly unlikely to even know they exist. Other times, the process of leaving a family plan can be complex, burdensome, and risky. Uh, beyond what is required in the Safe Connection Act, are there other things wireless service providers can do to help make it easier for victims to leave a family plan? Thank you, Congressman, for the for the question. Um, certainly, there are. One thing that springs to mind is that the phone providers could allow survivors to leave family plans based solely on a survivor's own sworn attestation of abuse. Now, although right, the the, the Safe Communications, uh, sorry, Safe Connections Act requires third party documentation. There's no reason why companies couldn't allow people to leave family plans based on their own affidavit. And so I think that's one thing that they could do. They could also certainly do more to warn account holders about the potential risks from family phone plans. And indeed, I think an earlier version of this bill uh, had a provision in there that required uh, adults of 18 years or older to sort of opt in to any of these monitoring features on a family plan, such as the location information that could be shared. And although that's no longer in the bill, I see no reason why phone companies couldn't do that and, and why they shouldn't do that. I firmly believe that they should. So those are just a couple of ideas of, of what they could do on their own uh, sort of volition. Thank you so much. As many of my colleagues are aware, representation at Big Tech for women and minorities is abysmal. There's only one woman to every 3.76 men employed at the big five tech companies, Amazon, Facebook, Apple, Google, and Microsoft. 
Racial diversity is also a major concern with an estimated 77.1% of venture-backed startup founders being white and only 1.8% black. Those numbers do not bode well for creating teams equipped to empathize with victims of digital abuse who are overwhelmingly women, racial minorities, and sexual minorities. Dr. Kadri, can you discuss how lack of representation in the tech industry can further harm survivors and what steps companies can take to do more to protect women, racial minorities, and sexual minorities? Certainly, Congresswoman, it's an excellent question and a really important issue. I think, you know, not only must these companies engage actively with questions of diversity in, in hiring, as, a, as one of the other experts earlier mentioned, actually kind of listening to survivors' stories and experiences and, and stopping treating them as kind of aberrant or rare or unusual is crucial. Even the language that gets used in the tech industry of, of kind of these uh, situations being treated as edge cases uh, is really problematic, I think. Uh, they aren't edge cases. They should be seen as stress cases. And here I'm drawing on, on work by Sarah Wachter Butchka, who, who's talked about this in, in, in her work. And so I think even that kind of terminology is important. Thank you. The Lifeline program is very underutilized with a participant rate that hovers at about 19% or 6.5 million households, despite estimates that more than 34 million households are eligible. Dr. Valentin, can you discuss the disproportional effects this has on low-income individuals, women, and people of color, and how we can work to reach those who will benefit most from the program? Yes, thank you so much for the question. Um, so yeah, when we're talking about folks who aren't connected, we're talking about our most vulnerable populations, which includes domestic violence survivors, and includes people who are experiencing homelessness, people of color uh, who are disproportionately in lower wage jobs. And so uh, the lack of connectivity impacts one's ability to have access to healthcare, impacts one's ability to have access to government services that are online, and even impacts one's ability to stay connected to family and friends. Um, but it can't be underscored enough that this is also about an economic opportunity gap. We're leaving these groups behind in, within a tech ecosystem and when we're not connecting them to broadband and all the opportunities that are associated with broadband. So we have to be able to lean on groups that have connections in the communities, fund these groups so they can fund their outreach efforts and uh, also needs to be more outreach efforts going on on the federal level as well. Thank you so very much. I'm out of time. So I yield back. Thank you. The general lady's time has expired. Thank you. Yield back. Um, the chair now recognizes uh, Mr. Beasy for five minutes to ask questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I, I think it's great that we're holding this hearing and uh, for the witnesses being here today. Uh, I think today's hearing reflects deliberate uh, and bipartisan uh, work that the committee has been able to accomplish to help uh, connect millions in urban and rural America and ensure we maintain a robust telecommunications infrastructure. Um, and especially in in, in areas uh, like that I represent uh, here in the Dallas Fort Worth area and every part of the country. It's just it's good that we're having this discussion. Uh, Dr. Valentine, uh, first of all, I want to say congratulations on your recent transition to the National Urban League. Uh, and uh, my first question deals with the FCC's Lifeline program and HR 4275, the ensuring phone and internet access for SNAP recipients uh, that was introduced uh, by my colleagues, uh, Luria and Katko. Uh, as you know, the legislation will require the FCC to submit reports on enrollment in the Lifeline program by those participating in SNAP. Uh, according to the uh, USAC in Texas, there are approximately 2.7 million lifeline eligible households, yet only about 280,000 are subscribed, which is a 10% uh, participation rate in the program. Uh, that is also much lower than the national average participation rate, which is around at uh, 20%, 19% uh, or so. 
uh, in your written questions, you suggested that the requirements of HR 4275 should also be extended beyond Lifeline to include the ACP, which is the long-term version of the emergency broadband benefit program that I helped introduce at the beginning of the pandemic. Can you explain the benefits of extending the requirements of this bill to go beyond the Lifeline program to also include a report uh, on enrollment in the affordable connectivity program by SNAP recipients? Yes, thank you so much for uh, the question and thank you for your leadership on the affordable connectivity program um, as well. Um, so I would kind of answer this question by saying that, you know, we need both the lifeline program as well as the affordable connectivity program. As you know, when you're applying these benefits, you can only apply it to either mobile services or your wireline services. And there are households across the country that need both. Therefore, we need to understand the data from both of those programs. And hopefully it will also help us understand if, for example, the lifeline subsidy needs to increase and how we can better uh, coordinate the programs as well. Uh, Dr. Valentine, you also talked in your opening statement about the National Urban League support for spectrum option winners to hire from underrepresented communities beyond entry level positions and to increase supp uh, supplier diversity. Uh, and as you know, many of these auction winners have also made commitments to incorporate racial equity initiatives into their businesses. Uh, do you think these winners are delivering on their promises? Um, I think that we can always do better, honestly. Um, and I think that it's this is something that National Urban League um, has been working on um, for years. But the more that we can integrate equity and inclusion um, into companies, the better. And it goes across the board from uh, the workers who are entering the field to the C-suite to what are the community investments are of these companies. And I know that sometimes, you know, it, it, people will say, well, it's better for Congress to stay on the sidelines and let the private sector work all this out or or we need some help from Congress. Do you think that there's anything that Congress can do to incentivize auction winners to hire, retain and promote underrepresented groups? Yeah, you know, I think, you know, any any legislation that you all introduce um, in this space would definitely um, be welcomed because, again, uh, we need to make sure that all communities are benefiting from this booming ecosystem. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and uh, with that, uh, uh, Madam Chair, I'm going to yield back, but thank you to the panelists. I thought that this was a, a, a very useful uh, topic today. Thank you, Madam Chair. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes uh, Ms. Clark for five minutes to ask questions. And thank you very much, Madam Chair, uh, for convening this very important hearing, and thank you to our panelists of witnesses for your expert testimony. Increased and targeted outreach efforts are necessary for all eligible families to take advantage of programs like the Lifeline program. HR 4275, the Ensuring Phone and Internet Access for SNAP Recipients Act of 2021 requires the FCC to submit reports on the effectiveness of various Lifeline program advertising efforts. Dr. Valentin, could you elaborate on how these reports could assist in increasing the utilization of the Lifeline program among SNAP recipients? Yes, um, you know, we really just need to know like where the gaps um, persist. And I would say that something um, as it relates to, you know, outreach efforts that we can sort of lean on and something National Urban League uh, talked about in recent comments um, to the FCC, you know, the CDC had a, a program, the Partnering for Vaccine Equity uh, Grant Program, and that is a model that the FCC um, can use um, as a CDC grantee, National Urban League, in conjunction with our amazing affiliates, about 35 of our affiliates, we were able to train 76,000 trusted messengers, we were able to establish um, 400 partnerships, open 270 non-traditional vaccination sites, and do a, about 1,000 events. And uh, we were able to then reach about 32 million people with our efforts. If we are able to kind of like copy those efforts for the Affordable Connectivity Program, that would be amazing. But again, in order to do these things, we have to have funding to do so. 
Got it, got it. Um, Ms. Gomez, the FCC Spectrum Auction Authority is set to expire in September of this year. Proceeds from the Spectrum Auctions have been used to fund key initiatives like the First Responder Network Authority. By extending the FCC Spectrum Auction Authority to March 31st, 2024, as stipulated in H.R. 7783, the Extending America's Spectrum Auction Leadership Act of 2022, would you opine a bit on other essential programs that could be funded through auction proceeds? Thank you, Congresswoman. Um, so I don't advocate for any particular programs, but I will list the ones that I have heard advocated that I that all sound terrific. Uh, so in no order of priority, um, you know, Chairwoman Con uh, Chair Chairwoman uh, Rosenworcel has supported ut utilizing um, spectrum auction proceeds to fund Next Generation 911, uh, which is largely overdue and I think would be a great use of the of the of the program. Um, I've also heard that uh, support for funding digital equity programs, such as what Dr. Valentin was talking about, uh, to continue our desire to get as much uh, uh, uptake as possible of broadband so everyone can benefit from the information economy. Um, I've also heard uh, that perhaps it could be utilized to continue the rip and replace efforts to replace uh, Chinese uh, manufactured equipment with non-Chinese, something more secure. Uh, those are the three that I've heard. And uh, so let's just call those illustrative. Uh, thank you, I appreciate it. HR 7132, the Safe Connections Act of 2022 requires service providers to provide information for survivors seeking to separate from a shared mobile service contract on their website in physical locations and other forms of consumer com uh, communication. Dr. Kadri, in your testimony, you indicated that some providers are voluntarily offering similar programs to help survivors of digital abuse, but the programs are not well advertised, so the survivors are not aware of these resources. Would it, wouldn't it be unlikely for a survivor to find this information via a provider's website or physical store if they're not the primary account holder, especially if the information is not prominently displayed? And if so, in that case, what would additional outreach efforts look like to reach as many survivors as possible through this legislation? Thank you, Congresswoman. It's an excellent point. Um, and that's certainly part of, of the concern, although, although I'll note it's usually possible even for secondary account holders to engage with phone companies, whether that's in person or online. And so I think the main concern driving the legislation is the sort of type of monitoring that uh, these plans enable. But that said, having conspicuous information available uh, is, is, you know, it's only going to be one part of it. It's, it's not a panacea. And so I agree that um, uh, many people will be in conditions where uh, they frankly won't be able to even make use of uh, some of the protections in this bill unless it's supplemented with other efforts. And so in terms of additional outreach, I think it's important to educate folks on the front lines uh, kind of of intimate partner violence about the dangers posed by technology. That's an important start. And we do some of that work at, at CETA and there are other great groups doing this. But I think if people don't know about the legal protections uh, that exist that are designed to help them, then they simply won't use them. Uh, thank you. And Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you. Madam Chair, unmute yourself. Thank you. <laughs> the gentle lady yields back. Um, the chair now recognizes uh, Mr. McEachin for five minutes to ask questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Dr. Valentin, you know, one of the one of the accomplishments that we've made during this uh, during this Congress, and I was proud to be part of it, was to establish the Affordable Connectivity Program as part of the Bipartisan Infrastructure Plan. And as you know, that helps qualifying households pay for internet service and buy devices that can access the internet. How can we, as members of Congress, uh, help our constituents know more about programs uh, like this one? Thank you so much for the question. Um, you know, the first piece of advice I guess I would give members of Congress is to partner with the National Urban League and our uh, local affiliates to get the word out about um, ACP. 
also partnering with small loan businesses, particularly those that are owned by people of color because they're trusted in local communities. And also we can't underestimate the power of paid media, particularly through uh, media organizations that are owned um, by people of color. And what I would also add again to, to members of Congress uh, uh, and ask is to make sure that you're allocating uh, funds for outreach organizations that are known and trusted um, in the communities. And also, you know, lean on the resources at the Federal Communications Commission. They're doing a great job with, with outreach and they've had hundreds of events um, at this point in time to know that they are always um, accepting speaker requests. And uh, I thank you for that answer. You mentioned in your testimony that proceeds from spectrum au auctions could be used to fund digital equity efforts. What kind of digital equity efforts uh, could be funded in your judgment? Yeah, um, so I think that when we're thinking about digital equity, it must be thought of uh, broadly and it must include affordability. Um, we have to find a way to sustain a, a meaningful affordability program for low income consumers. And one idea that has been out there is uh, the use of spectrum funds. Um, but we're also going to need uh, funds for um, devices. You know, through the affordable connectivity program, you get a one time uh, discount on a device. But what happens when you're device breaks or what happens when it's outdated and it can no longer run you know, new software. And also I would say we can use these funds to help um, upskill and reskill workers, particularly workers of color uh, for the jobs of tomorrow so that they can reap the benefits of the digital economy. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Kadri, I'd like to turn to you. And of course, in your testimony, sir, you left us uh, with some very interesting uh, thoughts about um, the family phone plans can pose actually uh, challenges to victims of, 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 of abuse. Um, we don't have a lot of time left, so let me just ask you this question. Once a victim is able to leave a family phone plan and that victim doesn't really have control of their own financial resources, how will affordability programs like Lifeline help victims who do not have, again, control of their own finances? Thank you, Congressman. It's a very important issue as well. You know, as I said in my testimony, victims really rely on communications technologies as a lifeline, right? I think that's why the lifeline uh, a program is called what it is. And so, you know, interpersonal abuse doesn't have this fixed expiration date. There's no neat line in the sand after a victim leaves uh, and the violence, you know, just suddenly ends. And so I think kind of uh, thinking about ways that these programs can can help support in a more enduring way is just crucially uh, important, um, you know, especially now, uh, given our increasing reliance on, on technology in the wake of the pandemic, uh, this is something that is only going to become more important, I think. Thank you for that. Um, in the long, very long minute and six seconds that we have left, can you sort of summarize some of the uh, ways that family plans are challenging and can pose dangers to uh, to victims of abuse? Absolutely. If I may, maybe I'll just uh, use that time to, to share a very quick story from our work at CETA, which I think is illustrative and brings the, the point home. You know, we had one client who became concerned that their partner was able to kind of routinely find out where they were and, and know who they were communicating with. And they were on a family phone plan together. And uh, she eventually tried to leave the phone, uh, you know, the phone plan by calling the phone company. And the company told her that there was another account holder who they needed to contact. And then suddenly, without informing the client, uh, dialed the abuser into a three way conference line. And not only did the abuser refuse permission to allow her to leave the plan, uh, this was obviously a deeply traumatic incident. And so even later, when the client was informed about a state law that could have allowed them to leave the family plan, even without his permission, she just declined to move forward because she was so scarred by that experience. And so experiences like that are, you know, are what I think um, we should be trying to avoid uh, through this law. I thank you. I thank the witnesses. And Madam Chair, I yield back. The gentleman yields back and uh, let me see the chair now recognizes Ms. Fletcher for five minutes to ask questions. Thank you so much uh, Chairwoman Matsui and Ranking Member Latta for having uh, this hearing today on strengthening our communications networks. It has been a very important and interesting hearing and I want to thank all of our witnesses for testifying before us today. Um, as many of uh, our colleagues and our witnesses have noted today, broadband networks and digital technologies 
are essential parts of our daily lives. Um, at the same time, because these technologies are so connected to our lives, they can also be used as methods of surveillance and control for those in unsafe situations. And like many of my colleagues, I am deeply concerned about what we have seen, especially recently, about the use of technology to track individuals um, and even the ability for others to, to buy that data. Um, that issue, some of the app tracking issues that we're talking about so much lately are not really before us in this hearing, but I do think that they are connected to the larger issues of privacy and safety in the legislation that we're discussing today, especially uh, in the Safe Connections Act. And I see Rep Custer, um, uh, has joined us, uh, who is, of course, the sponsor of that bill, uh, as well as Chairwoman Eshoo. Um, this is a really important bill for supporting survivors of domestic abuse and assisting them in cutting these digital and physical ties with their abusers, as so many um, of my colleagues have mentioned, as our witnesses have mentioned. Um, Dr. Kadri is the, the story that you, you just shared really illustrates. And I know in my home state of Texas, 40% of women and 35% of men experience intimate partner violence, rape, or stalking in their lifetime. And as we've heard, this bill will help them disentangle their lives from abusers by allowing them to separate their phone lines without um, penalties or burdensome requirements as they try to get off of these family plans. So I want to follow up on some of these questions. Um, in particular, Dr. Kadri, you mentioned in your testimony that the National Domestic Violence Hotline saw a 155% increase in digital abuse in a three-year period, even as rates of other forms of abuse remained fairly constant. Um, so I want to ask a couple of things. Based on your research, are there any explanations or theories that are available as to why that may be the case? And connected to that, do you anticipate that the rise in digital abuse will continue as digital technologies become even more interwoven in our daily lives? Thank you, Congressman. Uh, absolutely. I, I mean, I think, you know, part of it is is a story about how we're relying on technology more, but but it really does go beyond that. And I think this really gets to, to, to your point earlier, uh, that it's the type of technology that we're using that matters. And so many of the digital technologies uh, that are so prevalent these days fundamentally prioritize extracting as much data as possible from us. And this alone can create all sorts of risks, as we see with family phone plans and many other forms of technology that are that are used uh, to perpetrate abuse nowadays. Uh, and so I think that, you know, that is certainly one uh, part of the story. Another is that this technology often allows people to perpetrate harm from afar, often with relative anonymity and secrecy. And so proving who's behind it can be really difficult. And the other thing I'd say is I think the trivialization of digital abuse is really an important part of this story. It's less likely to be taken seriously. It's less likely uh, to people will identify it as abuse, less likely they may speak up. And of course, that can cut both ways. It might mean that the statistics are misleadingly low because people are actually underreporting. Uh, but maybe also part of the rise is being fueled by people feeling like they can get away with this and that it's not so serious. And so, I mean, I don't want to paint too pessimistic a picture, but you asked whether I, I think it's sort of inevitable that it'll keep uh, rising because of how interwoven tech is with our lives. And in some ways I do, um, but, but you know, with the important caveat that that doesn't mean that I think that kind of pragmatism or realism means that we should just give up. And to the contrary, I think we need to be thinking creatively and empathetically uh, to try and come up with ways to mitigate and, and address this kind of, of abuse. Well, thank you so much. That's incredibly helpful. And I, I have a limited amount of time left. So what I would love to ask you as a follow up and maybe all of our witnesses to weigh in, um, in in writing following the hearing is what kind of other issues of privacy and safety that you've identified in your work that our committee and the Congress should be looking at uh, to ensure the safety and protection for users. Obviously, we've got some great bills in front of us today, um, but this is one of many steps. And as you mentioned, um, there are a lot of things that we, we can and should be looking at. I would love it if you and, and any of our other witnesses um, who have joined us today want to share those thoughts um, uh, for the record uh, and, and submit that testimony in writing. I only have a few seconds left, so I just want to thank you all for your time and your work. And thank you, Chairwoman Matsui, again, for convening the hearing, and I'll yield back. Thank you. The gentlelady yields back. Uh, the chair now recognizes uh, Mr. Joyce for five minutes to ask questions. Thank you, Chair. 
Matsui and ranking member Lana for allowing me to wave on to today's communications and technology subcommittee hearing. And thank you to all the witnesses for testifying. Spectrum is vital for bridging the digital divide in my district, as well as across the entirety of the United States. Last week, I helped introduce with my colleagues HR 7783, Extending America's Spectrum Auction Leadership Act of 2022 to extend the FCC's General Spectrum Auction Authority by 18 months. By extending the FCC's authority, it allows for more opportunity to help rural Americans seek the connectivity that right now they so desperately need. As we have seen during this pandemic, more and more people are working, learning, and healing from home, and that requires additional broadband support. Congress must continue to show leadership on spectrum policy, and I implore my colleagues for the swift passage of H.R. 77H3. My first question is for you, Ms. Gomez. Assuming auction authority is extended, what additional policy reforms can be made to spectrum auction roles to promote international competitiveness, maximize spectrum use efficiency, and foster the rapid deployment of next generation technologies? Thank you very much for that question. Um, and I certainly agree with you that the spectrum auctions are important to ensure the rapid deployment of services to all areas, including rural areas. In terms of um, other changes, uh, statutory changes that could be made uh, to advance spectrum management, um, there are a few things uh, that I would I would recommend. One is kind of practical. Um, right now, the FCC and NTIA have fantastic engineering engineers, um, but it's a very difficult field to hire in uh, because honestly, the private sector keeps stealing all their good engineers. Uh, and can lure them away with much better benefits and, and uh, not benefits, much better um, salaries. So one thing that could be done is to give authority to NTI and to the FCC to actually hire at higher market rates, similar to what the SEC was able to do um, back in the uh, 2000s. Um, it's just practical, like I said, but it would help a lot to be able to have those engineering resources on staff to be able to quickly um, act to conduct the engineering studies. Continuing to support ITS is important as well, and continuing to support research and development to continue um, both the, the FCC, sorry, the US government participation in policy standard bodies, as well as to support industry representation in, um, in the engineering standards bodies would also be important. And thank you for that insight. Mr. Gibson, again, assuming that the auction authority is extended, what specific policy reforms would you recommend to promote the competitiveness, the maximizing spectrum use efficiency, and to foster rapid employment? Well, thank you for the question. That's excellent. And uh, in addition to what Ms. Gomez said, I, uh, one thing I would suggest is uh, promote stronger collaboration between federal and commercial users. Um, Right now, what happens, and actually we've begun down that path a little bit even now, I, I mentioned, you may have missed this, but I mentioned uh, at meetings I've been in uh, to deal with sharing issues in the 3100 to 3450 megahertz band. What, what seems to be happening is we've, we've moved more toward uh, allowing some collaboration, but I think officializing it and taking advantage, what Ms. Gomez said is absolutely true, and we've seen that across the federal space. Obviously, you know, better compensation for federal uh, 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 experts, but also taking advantage of experts in, in commercial and collaborating more and trying to fight, provide a collaboration framework uh, that allows collaboration without possible conflicts of interest. That might be threading the needle a little bit complexly, but we think that that can be done. It's being done now, it just needs to maybe be a more officialized. And in my brief time left, Ms. Gomez, do you agree that we in Congress should make it a priority to work on long-term spectrum pipeline bill? Uh, thank you so much for that question. And if I may just add to my prior uh, answer, of course, reforming the uh, the CSEA to use the spectrum relocation fund for additional incentives for both uh, federal and commercial users. Um, second, yes, I, I do think it's important for Congress to work on a, a federal spectrum bill, pipeline bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. I see my time is expiring and I yield back. The gentleman yields back. 
The chair now recognizes Ms. Custer for her five minutes to ask questions. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for allowing me to wave on to your subcommittee. I'm grateful for the opportunity. Many Americans have benefited from technological advances, including high-speed broadband, the internet, mobile phones, That's which right. many of us take advantage daily. However, we also know by some accounts, 95% of domestic abuse cases involve technology and countless others have suffered or perpetrated abuse online. Dr. Kadri, I'm so grateful for your expertise and your experience. In your testimony, you defined digital abuse as people exploiting technology to harm others, specifically involving the use of technology to control, harass, stalk, survey, or threaten someone in a way that invades their privacy or autonomy or harms them emotionally, physically, reputationally, or financially. Can you describe for us how family plans, which you refer to as a snake in the grass, can be a tool of such abuse? Absolutely. Thank you, Congresswoman, and thank you for your leadership on, on this bill. Uh, you know, one source of common information uh, is, is just the phone bill or other account records, right, which, which reveal, uh, you know, details about a victim's communications and can also provide clues about their location, you know, such as the area codes that they're calling um, or call patterns that they're making. Some family plans also allow an abuser to kind of listen uh, to a victim's voicemails and sometimes even see their their text messages. And so, you know, these kinds of, of, of surveillance, this level of surveillance and the type of surveillance just creates this justified, I think, anxiety as much as anything else. And I think that's what's at stake here. Well, thank you for your good work. And I'm proud to have introduced the Safe Connection Act. Uh, it's a bipartisan bill. Uh, with um, the Health Subcommittee Chair Representative Anna Eshoo and uh, Republican Representative Mr. Wahlberg, which provides a clear template for survivors to work with their phone carriers to exit from a family or shared account that they share with their abusers. Uh, again, Dr. Kadri, can you explain how the Safe Connection Act will help these survivors? Certainly. So I think, you know, Although a victim could simply abandon their phone, um, you know, theoretically and, and, and maybe avoid some of the risks that I've talked about during my testimony today, of course, there are many reasons why that might actually do them more harm than good, because phones are so often a lifeline amid abuse. And so even if, you know, then there are the high fees that come associated currently with kind of leaving a family phone plan. And so even if they have the funds to be able to leave, they can still encounter resistance from a phone company that has no legal obligation to honor line separation requests. And so a bill like the Safe Connections Act that would, um, you know, give them the right to leave safely and quickly uh, would be hugely important. Um, thank you for that. And I think you may have addressed this question, but I'll just add it, ask it quickly. Survivors of digital abuse with limited resources and income are often unaware that they may qualify for participation in federal programs that provide a discount on phone and broadband services, such as the Lifeline and affordable connectivity programs. But the Safe Connection Act requires the FCC to adopt rules to allow survivors facing financial hardship to enroll in one of these programs as quickly as possible, whether or not they otherwise meet the qualifications of the programs so they can receive a discount off of service for a short period of time while they're getting back up on their feet. Why, again, Dr. Kadri, is it important to ensure that these abuse survivors are able to maintain consistent communication services after they're allowed to separate from the shared account with their abuser? Absolutely. I'm happy to reiterate on this point because it is so important, I think. And, and it's just that people remain in deeply precarious positions long after they attempt to leave a relationship in one form or another. And so being connected through their phones is just crucial in regaining their independence uh, and in guarding against future abuse. And, and this, again, was always true. Uh, but it feels important to stress that these last two years, of course, our reliance on technology increasingly, and the way that our, you know, many of our interactions have been filtered through technology more and more has increased this risk of digital abuse. But it also means it's more important than ever for us to be able to use our devices safely, whether that's for social connections, work, ordering food, 
testifying before Congress, uh, you know, all of these different ways, it just shows how important it is. Uh, and so uh, survivors should be entitled to do that safely. Well, thank you. And thank you, Dr. Valentin, as well, for your work. And on behalf of the many members of the bipartisan task force to end sexual violence, I'm pleased to see the Safe Connections Act come forward today at this hearing. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I yield back. The general lady yields back. Um, at this time, I request unanimous consent to enter the following documents into the record. Letter from the Competitive Carriers Association in support of congressional efforts to extend the Federal Communication Commission's general spectrum authority, and a letter from Public Knowledge and Open Technology Institute without objection, so ordered. I'd like to thank today's witnesses and um, the committee members for participating in this hearing today. It has been informative and educational in a sense that Everyone here were agree was agreed upon the importance of these bills in a very bipartisan manner. So I want to thank you all very much for participating. Now I remind members that pursuant to committee rules, they have 10 business days to submit additional questions for the record to be answered by the witnesses who have appeared. I ask the witnesses to respond promptly to any such questions that you may receive. So at this time, the committee is adjourned and thank you so much for your participation.